It is now 12.35 p.m. and a quorum of the board is present. The regular meeting of the state board is reconvened. Ms. Evans, are there individuals who wish to address the board during today's meeting? Yes, there are people who have registered to provide public comment today and I will review the rules. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes to address the board and I will keep track of time. We will be strictly following the time limits so that everyone has an opportunity to speak. It is the practice of the board not to respond to comments during the public participation portion of the meeting. We will maintain an atmosphere of respect for all people. Any person disrespecting anyone by name or otherwise will be asked to cease. Public par participation will occur in person and virtually. We will begin with the persons that are physically in the room with us today and then mo move to those in the queue online. And today we do not have any public participation um, for persons that are in the room and we will pivot to those online first then. Um, there is nobody uh, waiting to be entered for public hour. Okay, thank you, Sarah, very much. <coughs> that concludes public comment. Then. We made up those twenty minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was public comment. That was public comment. Okay, all right, very good. <clears throat> For the next item on today's agenda is a presentation on Michigan school meals. During this presentation, representatives from the Michigan Department of Education will be providing an update on the Michigan School Meals Program, the state-funded program providing free breakfast and lunch to all children attending public schools. We welcome our presenters, Dr. Diane Golzinski, Deputy Superintendent, Division of Finance and Operations, Ms. Melanie Brumler, Interim Assistant Director in the Office of Health and Nutrition Services, Ms. Mary Darnton, SNS, Food Service Director in Hudsonville Public School District and Jenison Public Schools. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. I will note that um, this was originally scheduled to be the only thing between uh, you and lunch, but we decided we did not want Michigan School Meals to intrude on your school meals board. Presenters, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Rice. It's great to be here with you all. I'm so excited to share um, Melanie and Mary's expertise with you, and we will go ahead and get started and celebrate some news that we are really excited to share. So, good afternoon. I am Melanie. Um, I am super excited today because we are helping kids. That's the big headline for me. We are helping kids. School meals are everywhere in the state. So to start out, um, each year program sponsors must complete an application process with MDE to continue to participate in our federal child nutrition programs. It takes about until mid-October for everything to get wrapped up and we have the final data on who is in, who is out, and know how many kids we are feeding. I'm super excited to say that when it all was said and done this October, we have 100% of all schools participating in the National School Lunch Program and School Breakfast here in the state of Michigan serving free meals to their students. That's an applause line. <laughs> So that is 1.3 million students with access to breakfast and lunch during their school day here in Michigan. In the preliminary data for August 2023, there were almost 112,000 more students eating lunch daily than in August of 2022, and almost 57,000 more students eating breakfast daily. That's an increase of 28% for both breakfast and lunch, and that equates to a total increase um, in breakfast served of 47% and for lunch, 45%. And as of right now, we still have some data coming in. We had we did 100, or I'm sorry, 1.3 million more meals were served in August than August of 2022. <clears throat> okay. So let's talk a little bit about the program. So what is eligible for Michigan School Meals? Well, meals served to students who attend public school districts, public school academies, and intermediate school districts are eligible for the state reimbursement <laughs> and the program. The reimbursement covers meals served in, to students in kindergarten to grade 12, 
pre-kindergarten classrooms, such as the Great Start Readiness Program or tuition-based four-year-old preschool. And also it covers meals served to students in our special needs, special education programs up to age 26. <clears throat> so what is not eligible? Unfortunately, the program currently does not cover all meals in the state. Meals served in non-public schools are not eligible for the state program and reimbursement. This includes non-public schools that are, on, that are their own sponsor with us, as well as those that have an agreement maybe with a local school district, a local public school district to provide meals to them. It also doesn't cover meals that are served in Great Start Readiness Program and, and preschool programs that are run by what we call community-based organizations. It also doesn't cover meals served to children age three and under. Um, however, we do still have the federal child and adult care food program and those meals are eligible for that reimbursement. And lastly, it doesn't serve meals served to teachers and staff or volunteers um, and that, that's a federal rule and it still applies to the state reimbursement too. So what are the requirements for our sponsors to participate and receive the, the state funding? So all schools must participate in both the national school lunch and school breakfast programs and follow the USDA regulations. They must implement the federal community eligibility provision on behalf of one school, a group of schools, or the entire school district. And this is so that they maximize the federal reimbursement. That community eligibility program has been around for over 10 years here in the state of Michigan and it has allowed um, schools to serve meals to children at no cost for its entire um, time. And so we are just using it to maximize and continue to get in more federal reimbursement um, to help offset the state funding. Sponsors must take all efforts to maximize and implement policies to collect relevant family income information for the purposes of determining student eligibility and for the federal meal reimbursement. So our education benefits forms, um, they used to be called free and reduced applications, but we've changed the name to make sure that uh, we're really getting at what the forms are now used for. Um, so school districts have to work to continue to get those forms in. And then the big one, at least in my opinion, is schools had to write off all outstanding student meal negative balances that in of itself did away with lunch shaming, and that is important to me. So keep in mind the program is optional, and that's why it's really exciting that we had so many schools opt into the program. There are also some recommendations in the legislation. It states that participating entities are encouraged to offer meals that meet students' dietary restrictions, including the prov a provision for gluten-free meals, vegetarian meals, vegan meals, and upon request, kosher meals, halal meals, and following the federal rules, any meals meeting an allergy restriction as confirmed by a physician. So what can we expect to see with Michigan School Meals? It really doesn't change the landscape from the federal program. Um, meals still have to be served in a congregate setting, just like the National School Lunch Program and School Breakfast Program, and our Great Start Readiness program classrooms have to serve family style meals. Unlike when we had some of the pandemic waivers, we have to serve the meals um, on campus so they can't be sent home, delivered, or picked up by parents or guardians. They're, the only exception to taking meals off campus would be for a field trip and as long as the meals meet the federal requirements, it's okay to, to have them during the field trip. They have to, this program operates during the academic school day, just like the federal program, and the meals have to meet the federal meal pattern requirements for the National School Lunch Program, school breakfast, and preschool program. And they have to be reimbursable. So there's a lot to that. Um, meeting the meal pattern, counting them correctly, they have to be reimbursable, and so students still have to be charged for a la carte and second meals. And I'm gonna turn it over to Mary to give her perspective. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rice and board for having me here, for allowing me to speak and share some of what's happening as the boots on the ground, or as I say, the hands that do the work every day at school. Um, I'm a lunch lady and <laughs> I, I love to feed kids. And I will just say for someone who's done this for the better part of 27 years, this has been a real dream come true for me um, and for all of my kids and families that I serve. So I'm the food service director for Jenison and Hudsonville and Hudsonville Christian Elementary. So we are a, a group of two districts that share uh, this service and partner together to offer that. Our total enrollment is anywhere between 13,000 and 14,000 students on a given year. Um, we over, I oversee 24 school buildings between um, all three of those entities. And the percent of my students who are eligible for free and reduced price meals is about 26%. That's an aggregate of both school <coughs> districts. So uh, you would consider me, um, I'm just regular. Uh, I don't, my school district does not qualify for CEP. So we are one of those school districts that opted in because we feel it's the best choice for our students. Um, so I brought, and my, my friends, I love a spreadsheet. And uh, I really track data closely because I like to know um, amongst our students who is participating and how often. And, and I work to continually increase the number of kids I feed because if they're not fed, they can't do well in the classroom. So I just took a look at my two districts and what we did from September 2022 to September 2023. Um, and, and because I know my superintendents would appreciate this, I break the data out in between Jenison and Hudsonville. So Jenison's in the green because our colors are green, and Hudsonville's in the blue because our colors are blue. So my happy place is watching, is seeing what those numbers have done from just a year ago until now. We've seen a 130% increase at Jenison from breakfast in September of 22 to 23. We've, in Hudsonville, a 272%. I mean, these numbers are huge. I, I even struggle to articulate how much this means to me that we are reaching those kiddos at breakfast time. Then you look at lunch, and we are up 42% from a year ago in Jenison and 48% from a year ago in Hudsonville. Um, this to me illustrates the point that we are removing barriers to access for students to get to a meal if they need it. I consider myself here for all students, regardless of their ability to pay. Um, we are there to help nourish their bodies so that they can better learn. And removing those barriers to access, especially to price, um, really levels the playing field for my students. And what it does for their families at home. Um, hundreds, if not close to thousands of dollars a year, especially I'm sure many of you could have a teenager in your household and you understand how difficult it is <clears throat> to keep our teenagers fed. And the money that we're saving them from purchasing meals at school is staying in the household. Um, it's being used to purchase more groceries. It's being used to pay the bills of the home and and to do the things and, and live the lives that we need to live. So I'm thrilled that I can share these numbers with you. Um, we're just happy to have, to see more of our students participate, to hear more voices in the cafeteria, um, and to know that we can now look at a child who could be in crisis, having a bad day, all of those things. We can see if one of their first <coughs> needs is hunger because if we can take care of that immediate need, um, then we're already on the way to improving their day and, um, and beyond. So there's my soapbox. But I wanna talk to you about the other gift that we've been given in Michigan, which is 10 cents a meal for Michigan schools, kids and farms. I still call it 10 cents a meal. Um, as you know, this is a program that we started small as a pilot project in Michigan. And over the, over the last several years, we have built up to expand further and further from just regional capabilities to statewide. And so this is our opportunity to, uh, you can't spend money better than going to your local farmer or a distributor that can have Michigan grown products and get them directly into our schools so that we can teach kids about the amazing job we do in Michigan growing food. Um, so one of the ways we use our 10 cents a meal 
funds outside of just supporting the regular um, fruit and vegetable choices on our menu. This is a new program we started this year with our 10 cents a meal funds and we call it pop-up produce. Um, these are snapshots from our social media. Um, we look at 10 cents a meal not only to support the regular school day, but since we consider every space a classroom. The cafeteria is a classroom where learning happens. Um, and so we're taking this opportunity with pop-up produce to um, use this as nutrition education <coughs> to expose our students to products and to fruits and vegetables that may be grown here and expose them to food for the first time. I'm sure you've all had the experience of teaching your little ones to eat broccoli. And the broccoli is sometimes a hard ask for a two-year-old, but you keep showing that to them and you keep they keep seeing it over and over again and they learn how, how to eat it and how it tastes and, and we expose them to it more. We're developing that lifelong habit. I am telling you that I dearly love Brussels sprouts, but I had never had a gooseberry until I bought some for my kiddos to try. And we sent it to a couple schools, and we love our alliteration, pop-up produce at Park Elementary. Please partake. <laughs> and we offered those students an opportunity to try a gooseberry for the perhaps the first time in their life to see what it tastes like and what it feels like, to get that sensory expectation, to have a fun activity at lunchtime, and just to expose them to a new food. Um, we love our roasting our vegetables, especially for our middle school and high school students. So Brussels sprouts was huge. You, we just thought, let's start with a 20 pound case for each secondary. That means middle school or high school. Here's our recipe to roast them. Let's see what happens. And I'll tell you, my kids love Brussels sprouts. So they're gonna be making more of an appearance now from the future. For the first time, I put eggplant on the menu and we made ratatouille out of the eggplant. It was delicious. And we offered it to students as a free sample because this might have been their first exposure to it. No better way to get them to try it than so they can offer it to them to try without having to worry about being wasteful or not liking it. It's okay not to like something, but we want you to have a chance at it. We also did kiwi berries. I'd never seen a kiwi berry before we did this either. And so we started small. It went well at those two other schools. We were able to secure some more kiwi berries. So we did it at a couple other buildings just to show our kiddos um, what this food did. And then lastly, the pawpaw. And I had never seen a pawpaw before in my life or how it, how it came. And I, I had to learn about this product that is native to the United States and can grow here. And it's this amazing tropical flavored item. It, it really does taste like a mango, banana, and a pineapple all at once. It's fantastic. We had to learn how to cut it, what we were going to serve it with. So we're learning right alongside our kids. But this is what those 10 cents a meal allows us to do. It does not cover the whole cost of that item, but it gives us some money towards it as allows us to do goodwill activities, nutrition education in our cafeterias, and expose our kids to different things they may have not seen before. Um, we can't really call asparagus season pop-up produce, but I will tell you when asparagus comes into season, we can't seem to keep enough uh, to offer it on the menu for a day. We just go through cases upon cases upon cases upon cases of asparagus to roast for our kiddos to try and to put on the menu. Obviously, Michigan apples, you all know that cornerstone of our produce and our pride and what we grow in Michigan are apples. And so we're thick in the middle of apple season. Um, and we're going to enter and see in the wintertime, we're going to see our squashes and our winter crops um, making an appearance. We'll get into the spring and we'll look at cherries. We'll look at asparagus in May. Then when we start school again, it's stone fruits and other things that are really in season right when we're starting back to school. This is what those 10 cents allows us to experiment with. So we love it. We love it. Um, and I think that's my, oh, it's just so you know, it requires work for us to, to spend those 10 cents. But if we can commit to that and we're getting that additional 10 cents from the state, can, can't spend it better. <clears throat> Stays within our borders, goes to our farmers, um, mm. teaches kids about fruits and vegetables. And my friends, when the fruit or vegetable makes the meal free 
And that is the trigger for us. If there's a fruit or vegetable for that child on the plate, that's the biggest hurdle, and that's the item we have to have for that meal to be reimbursable to the federal government. The fruit or vegetable makes it free, right? If we can show them how fun fruits and vegetables are, and they're grown right here, um, and we're positive about the program and keep talking about it, then the success um, just keeps growing. So thank you for your time today. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> thank you very much. A samples? I did, not bring samples. I did not bring samples. Because we, we, were, we were not told that this was going to be BYOGB, that this was going to bring your own gooseberries. I just opened the invitation. If you ever take your show on the road and you want to come and visit, um, I am right on the other side of Grand Rapids, right across the Grand River from Grand Rapids in Ottawa County. And, you know, we're a breadbasket in Ottawa County, so... No, um, no telling what sort of stray visitors you'll get. You never know. Thank you. Always happy to have you. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your presentation. Ms. Lipton. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm not a foodie, but I always admire people that do have um, a love of food and nutrition, and, and you clearly do, so thank you for that. Um, I wanted to just ask you, uh, just in your, in, your, in your judgment, so I agree that the increase in the breakfast program is really pretty remarkable, mm -hmm. um, and certainly in the lunch, too. Um, and you talked about additional, uh, additional funding. Are there other sort of best practices that districts can look at <coughs> Um, to, to see that kind of a jump, whether it's through the application process or, or how the food is served? Or what other best practices, in your opinion? Well, I think, I think I'm an example of a district that would otherwise not qualify for a CEP program to, to have 100% of my children eat for free outside of Michigan free school meals. So obviously I'm seeing those increases. <coughs> um, we try our best to have, let our families know that that application for education benefits is more than just the meal now. Um, and that we, we have other programs and other areas that can help families out when, um, when trying to gather that paperwork. As far as best practices, it, you have to be unafraid to talk, to talk about these things and to repeat your message over and over again. And we never stop communicating with all levels of families and community members and all of our stakeholders about the fact that we are there for them and we operate these programs. And we're happy to be a foundation that the rest of the school district rests on to keep their kids going. Um, I would just say the best practice for any one of us can do is to not give up and to find a mentor and a friend to help them navigate these challenges. And we share our stories and successes with each other all the time. We're a very close-knit group in the food service world. Um, and we just share. And when, when oh, um, and making sure we're available to our friends to say, I can help you with this if you're unsure where to go. We're very collegial in that regard. We get amazing <clears throat> support from our partners at the Michigan Department of Education and from other allied partners like United Dairy Industry in Michigan. Um, it's just... Uh, Honestly, it's deciding where, where you want to start and go from there. I just, Mr. Chair. Just Please, yes, follow. absolutely. Um, so you, you mentioned, I think you said about 27% of your population is um, free and reduced. Eligible for free reduced meals. Eligible for free yes. Reduced. Okay, so, you know, roughly 30% and 70% not. Well, 70% who choose not to, well, it's probably correct. As we look at census data, it's probably fairly close to the, you know, we compare census data to, right. to, to the, the response rate for applications, and that's pretty accurate in my community. So, um, uh, you might have to re-answer, you might have to re-ask that question. I'm not sure oh, where I was going. No, no, no. So, so I just, so um, yeah, that was a, a precursor. So, my question is, um, there's a sort of conventional wisdom that, that some students um, won't partake of free and reduced lunch or what have you because mm -hmm. of stigma or what have you. Sure. Do you. Do you see any of that in the differentiated population? And yes. if so, what do you do or what are some ideas to sort of overcome that well, practice? 
first of all, having school meals free for public schools is pretty much almost an instant removal of barriers to access because suddenly it does not suddenly it does not matter what is what funds are coming into that household in order to qualify for this program. It's one of the, when you're running a national program like school lunch and you have to say what mechanism we're going to put in place, we're going to ask people to tell us these private details about their income and the number of people in their households so we can offer them the services they, that they need. And for some folks, they not, not, don't love that. <clears throat> and I completely agree. But as, as someone who is there for all students, we try to make sure that the experience of getting meals is as seamless as possible, that we try to remove other barriers, whether they're technological, whether it's scheduling, whether it's transportation, we try to remove other barriers. But price was a barrier. And the reason I know price was a barrier is because I'm seeing increases in my participation across every category. I still have to track who qualifies for paid meals, who qualifies for free, who qualifies for reduced. Every single one of my categories, participation is up. It's not just the paid kiddos. So what happens when you level the playing field is that if everyone's the same and everyone can go to the cafeteria and get a meal, then suddenly kids don't differentiate between one another anymore. And I will tell you, students are savvy. And if there's one person out of a friend group that the friends know, they bring their lunch every day. Their family life isn't the best. Sometimes they don't have food. Out of solidarity, these students will take care of one another, whether it's sharing food, whether it's not participating because no one wants to be alone going into the, to the cafeteria. That's what I see more, is that students who do not want to be alone, their friends stick with them. And if one doesn't go in, the rest don't go in. When there's no barrier to price, suddenly your only choice is or the decision that a student is going to make at that point, at that moment, am I hungry? What's on the menu? And to me, that says the, the, that power of that decision rests in that student um, to be like, this is what I need at this point. And I'm especially thankful that I see big participation increases amongst all those levels at my middle schools and high schools. You know, often is this is when responsibilities for taking care of yourself start to be handed over to the child. And so if they're busy and they're jam-packed for time or they're just being youth, they're just being kids, we are here for them when they get to school. So I don't have to worry about the wallet anymore and I don't have to be the debt collector anymore, which is heartbreaking to do. Thank you. You're welcome. And kids are eating more. Yes, they are. I, I see them eating, oh my goodness. When you have to, as the lunch lady, say, okay, we're going to have to start limiting the number of multiple <laughs> fruit and vegetable servings. I never thought I'd have such a problem. Happy to do that and to be the lunch lady saying, let's make sure whatever we take, we eat. And then we start focusing on eating what's on the plate before we go back and get more. But, um, hey, great problem to have. Like, great problem to have. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Other, um, thank you, Ms. Lipton. Other board members? Um, a thought and, and, a and a couple of questions. Um, as we're sitting here uh, talking, and I, re I remember uh, vividly, and I, I've remembered <coughs> it before, but hadn't mentioned it. I remember um, one, of, one of my most vivid memories of kindergarten was going half day, getting there, I was hungry. And somehow, I don't know if I asked for it or if the teachers offered it, but gave me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and then called my mom and told her that I was hungry. So my mother, I remember getting home and my mother was like, um, okay, um, they're going to take you away from me because they're going to think that I didn't feed you. <laughs> I mean, half jokingly, but I mean, that's just something that I just remember, um, you know, and just thinking you know, about this uh, and talk about this often, but just thought about how that applies here. Um, question is, are you all serviced by the kids food basket? In or West, work with? Um, we use, in West Michigan, we are, um, our big program is called Hand to Hand. It's our weekend okay. backpack program. Yes. Okay. But also kids food <coughs> basket is, is active in the West Michigan area. Okay. I am more, I am just starting to learn about our kids food basket organization in West okay. Michigan. 
but I have more of a knowledge of our hand to hand, which is our weekend backpack program mm -hmm. that is run in our area. Um, and uh, I will just say the need for those services has not gone away right. um, because as we know, we're ha we can feed those kiddos while they're at school and the other meals and their food insecurity did not end just because meals became free at school. So we're happy to see these programs still in robust need okay. getting to those, those kids and families on the weekends. And um, <clears throat> it's still a need, but we're happy to help fill that need at school. Mm -hmm. so. and it was really oh, and I'm so sorry. I can just, my heart hurts for you as a kindergartner. <laughs> Um, and I'm sure there was real fear for your mom. That's what it used to be like, right? I, yeah, I mean, I think she was partially joking, but at the same time, oh. yes. At, at the same time, yeah, there there, you know, are those stigmas and fears of, you know, children going to school and asking for something that's not Wish theirs. I could go back in time and say, mm -hmm. come on down to the cafeteria and we'll get you some breakfast. Exactly. Yep. Um, Going to, uh, in, in the breakfast in the morning, and you might have mentioned this, and maybe we've discussed it here, is, are the breakfasts served in the cafeteria or in the classroom? Do children have access to it you, that show up? We can serve breakfast just about anywhere the need is. So traditional is serving it in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. More prevalent is breakfast in the classroom, which takes meals to those classes, becomes a part of the instructional day because it can be counted as instructional time if the district chooses to do that, local decision. Um, we take the meals where they're needed. If it's, we know the concentration of students getting off the buses at a particular door or entrance that is on the opposite side of the building from the cafeteria, how can we take breakfast to the kids? We can follow the USDA regulations about time, service, making sure they have the appropriate signage and all the food choices there. And the rest of it comes down to technology and people to make sure we can do it. But we have become very creative in the last 15 years about taking food to where it's needed, meeting our students where they are, because their time is precious in the morning as well. So we can serve breakfast in the hallway, in the cafeteria, in the classroom, um, we're not serving on the playground. Um, no, that's not a that's not a good place to serve breakfast. If it's um, where the buses let off, or mm -hmm. you know this room while this building's under construction, we're going to serve in this room. As long as we are clear, working with our partners at MDE to say I have to change my service model and it's approved and we can put a plan in place. Um, then and and our principals are happy with it. Don't we don't make decisions in a in a vacuum. We need our principals there behind us to support. Um, we will take the meals to where the students are. And, I, and that the thought there too is children who are showing up a little late, yes. you know, in truancy and hungry children. That's not good. And I, I see you. Um, uh, Mitch uh, wanting to get in and the other one is the family style uh, meal service. I didn't know Family I style. congregate and family style. Okay, congregate means we all are sitting together right. in the cafeteria right. to eat our meal. And that's the traditional way we're used to. Right. Family style for those three and four year olds means they're sitting down together at a table. The food is not served in individual portions <clears throat> on their plates. We have bowls and we they learn to pass to help themselves. Part of it's motor skills, right? To learn how to, and everyone has to try. Okay, at that age, we don't let them opt out. Even if it's a no thank you bite, you know, that, that idea, we're going to put it on there so they start to get exposed to those fruits and vegetables. It's, you know, their brains are learning. The, but the family style is also how we learn to sit at a table, how we learn to eat, manners, using those small fine motor skills. And, you know, it's breaking bread. Um, so that's really important at that three and four year level because they learn from one another and they take their cues from one another. And so they learn... They're learning for the future about how they're going to sit at the lunch table and comport themselves um, or at the dinner table or the breakfast table at home. So that's why family style is important for those three and four year olds. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Thank you, Mary. Dr. Robinson. So in Hudsonville, you had an almost 300% increase yes. in the number of breakfasts and almost 50% in lunches. Yes. Could you do that with your, with your current staffing? Or did you have to hire more help? Yes. And we if have to so, hire, we have, where does that money come from? And well, 
Well, I'm glad you asked. Yeah, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I will say that because we are receiving the absolute maximum, we're maximizing those federal dollars, state of Michigan's kicking in the, the difference for those other kiddos, we're finally getting an even revenue stream for each type of meal, whereas before each type of meal had a different price associated with it, and we had to work out of that budget. When you serve more meals and you buy more food, you need to have more staff to serve them. And when you're doing that and getting those reimbursements that really cover your costs, you are able to add staff and hours to their schedules. If I can create more positions and put more people to work, give them more hours, these are the hands that do the work. I think I've already created at least six positions going into the school year because we just need more hands to do the work. Um, we're a very efficient operation, um, and our districts have been um, keeping, helping us try to keep pace with, with wages because we know that that's everywhere, right? Um, but we're seeing more people looking at us as an option for employment and saying, oh, I like working for the schools. And, and look, they get to feed all these kids. And a lot of people look at it and say, I never would have thought of this before, but now that it seems, to, you know, now that these barriers have been removed, as a parent, I, I would love to come in and do this work with you. Um, so I love the fact that we get to put more people to work and give them more hours and put more money in their paycheck so they can keep it at home. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Robinson. Any other questions? Comments. Okay. Thank you to our presenters. Great job. Very exciting. Absolutely food for thought. <laughs> Next time you come back, gooseberries. When we go there, yes. gooseberries. I'm not sure they're going to be in season, Dr. Rice, but if you commit to a visit, I will do my best to find something for you to sample. Very good. All Thank right. you. Thank Take you. care. Mystery bear. <laughs> Board members, it is uh, 212. We're at approval of minutes of regular and committee of the whole meeting of September 12, 2023. May I please have a motion to approve the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of October 10, 2023. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Second moved by uh, Mr. Bullock, seconded by Dr. Pritchett. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? Yes. And Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. There you go. So while we're on a roll board, uh, approval of minutes of the Legislative Committee meeting of November 2nd, 2023. Could I have a motion to approve? Mo moved by our chair, Dr. Pritchett. Do I have a second? Yeah. Second from Dr. Robinson. Any discussion? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? Yes. And Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Board at 213. The next item on today's agenda is a presentation on library book selection and book reconsideration. Michigan Department of Education and Library of Michigan representatives will be providing a presentation on best practices for school library book selection and book reconsideration. Mm -hmm. We welcome our presenters, Dr. Diane Golzinski, Deputy Superintendent, Division of Finance and Operations, Dr. Delsa Chapman, Deputy Superintendent in the Division of Educator, Student, and School Supports, Dr. Corinne Edwards, Director of the Office of Educational Supports, Mr. Randy Riley, State Librarian, Library of Michigan, and Claire Membiella, Library Law Consultant in the Library of Michigan. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. Presenters, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having us. It's, it's great to have an opportunity to talk about this with all of you. Again, my name's Randy Riley. I'm the state librarian. And I'll apologize before we get started. When I was at Central Michigan being trained as an educator a million years ago, it was always I would get in trouble about the number of words I had in my handouts or my presentations. There's a lot of words on these slides. Um, we'll be hitting the high points of those. Um, so I apologize about that beforehand, but um, you'll hear us, disclaimer, Claire is here as our, our law expert. Whenever I start, I go out and talk about anything legal, it's 
make sure you do the disclaimer. This is not legal advice. It's information. And if you really need legal advice, you need to uh, uh, can, um, talk with your attorney. So we always put that out there. Overview of what we're going to do today. You're going to hear me say the word policy a lot because cr the creation of good, solid policies and procedures is really important when you look at collection building and reconsideration of materials. Um, so you'll hear me say that a lot. But we're going to talk about libraries, what they are, talk a little bit about the First Amendment, alignment to teaching and learning, collection policies, the considerations you have to have, and then the criteria for reconsideration. Um, first off, library, what is a library? A library means a different thing to a lot of people, or some people think a library is one thing. When we're talking here today, we're looking at there are classroom libraries, every teacher um, I think has a certain number of books that they make available in their classroom. You may be lucky enough to have an actual centralized school library, media center in your building. They're in Michigan. We have a half dozen school public libraries where the public library is located within the school. And we have public libraries that are out there that are open to the entire community. For this talk, we'll be primarily focusing on school libraries as an organized central library uh, collection in those schools. And in Michigan, we've had some challenges in the last, since about 2003, um, we've lost about 63% of our li school librarians and media specialists. And we've dropped down to being ranked 46th in the country for what we're doing with school libraries in the country. So we do have some, some room to grow and improve in that area. Um, <clears throat> there has, for the First Amendment, there has been quite a bit of case law touching on the First Amendment um, that touches on what's happening in libraries and, and school libraries. And there are a few things we pulled together for, um, for uh, four rulings and four things that have come out of those, those considerations. One is um, the courts have said school officials determine what the curriculum is going to be and what school library materials will be in the library. Um, the courts have also said, you know, students have a, a right to choose materials that represent multiple viewpoints and uh, have some say in the directing of their learning and how it supplements what they're learning in the classroom. The courts have also supported um, policies that saying that there should be reasonable and um, open ways for parents to be involved in this process of what's in libraries, what my children are reading. And finally, um, schools have said, you know, media specialists, librarians have the authority, the responsibility to, direct, to develop collection development policies and policies that explain how and why they're adding certain things to the collections. At this point, I think, Dr. Are you going to take Dr. it, Dr. Chapman. Chapman? Okay. Thank you, Randy. So focusing on alignment to teaching and learning, um, the earlier slide defined a school library as an organized collection of print and digital materials that exist outside the physical classroom. We share additionally that the school library is often a gateway to opportunities specific to teaching and learning. For Michigan students, that gateway is rooted in Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan, as you see here noted on the screen. The goals of the plan are shared here with those bolded being directly aligned to teaching and learning. School libraries improve early literacy and in essence contribute to a student's transition from learning to read in grades pre-K through three to reading to learn in grades four and well beyond. As students are reading to learn, school libraries include resources specific to goal three improve the health, safety, and wellness of all learners. Hence, when school libraries are outfitted to support the whole child, goals four, five, and six are met with consistency. The school library therefore supports teaching and learning as an additional tool of academic support beyond the classroom. And now to Dr. Edwards, who will share the tenets of an effective school library and the MDE supports for those effective school libraries in Michigan. Thank you, Dr. Chapman, and good afternoon, board members. The MDE Effective School Library Toolkit for Administrators states that the mission of an effective school library is to ensure that all students 
and staff have access to and are effective users of ideas and information shared both digitally and in print. Its programs and offerings should align with the mission, goals, objectives, and curriculum of the school, provide personalized learning environments, offer equitable access to resources to ensure a well-rounded education for every student, empower students to be critical thinkers, enthusiastic readers, skilled researchers, and ethical users of information, and should support reading information technology and college and career readiness through teaching of research and digital citizenship skills. School library materials should be content rich, robust, inclusive, and equitably accessible so as to provide students, teachers, and parents with choices in what they select and or are assigned to read alongside of, outside, outside of, or separate from the district's board approved curriculum and its selected high quality instructional materials. The collection should provide a broad range of options and choices of high interest materials to encourage students reading and support their learner outcomes. Reflecting on the how and the why of literacy, school libraries support the why as they should be spaces of joyful manifestation where curriculum, community, and consciousness uncover what makes each student special. In her book, Unearthing Joy, Dr. Goldie Muhammad shares this thought. Joy is the ultimate goal of teaching and learning. Our school libraries should be those spaces and places where students are welcome to explore their personal interest, unearth their joy of reading by offering materials of interest reflecting mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors, and cultivate each student's lifelong love of learning. As shared previously, the top 10 SCP guiding principles, number three states, all students are encouraged to express their creativity, have voice in their own learning, and feel connected to their schools. School libraries are critical and important factors in contributing to the realization of this principle. To support this effort, MDE has developed related resources and have provided technical assistance and support to schools and districts on the use of eligible supplemental federal grants to increase access to diverse reading materials for all students across all grade levels. And I'll turn it over to Claire. Back to Mr. Mr. Riley. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, here's where we get into the, the policy part uh, of the discussion, which is um, crucial. And the first part, before you start talking about uh, book challenges or reconsiderations, addressing how materials actually are purchased and added to a collection is really important. And then under policy considerations, we have the, the clean uh, statement here. The policy should be clear. So most people, everyone from the community who looks at these policies, they should be understandable and make sense of those. They should be legal. The, the policy should not be asking the districts, the schools to be doing things that they should not be doing. It should be enforceable. Um, it should be available, so if someone from the community wants to see it, they shouldn't have to stand on their head to get access. It should be there, and it should be viewpoint neutral, balanced, looking at both sides of issues is very important when you're looking at these policies. Um, collection development really takes on the three roles. Part of it is the purchasing, the, the building the collection. The second part is maintaining, and the third part, if there are reconsidera reconsiderations or challenges. When you're looking at collection development, actually the policy should, has to clearly explain how and why we're building this collection. Um, this, the creation of that policy is a great opportunity, and one of the things that we stress with people who are doing that, um, of trying to open it up and involve community in that creation of that policy. If it's a school that we're talking about, having mm -hmm. teachers, having um, parents, having students, having different folks have some say in what that collection policy is gonna state, having those conversations is really good moving that forward. Um, you should be able to make it very clear, transparent and inclusive as you're going into that. The second part, which is the collection maintenance, is what's, what is sometimes 
doesn't get a lot of attention is why do things stay in the library? Um, every inch of library shelf space in a school is valuable, and there needs to be a reason for having a book access and take up that space. So circulation statistics are very important when you're looking at that. How often do students use this book? Check it out. Um, that is hugely important. And adding and removing books based on certain criteria. Why do we want to keep things versus why do we want to withdraw? In a lot of places, if a book hasn't circulated in a certain number of years, a year, two years, three years, it is probably going to be off the shelf and something new is going to be there to replace it. So you have to have those policies explained in, in your collection development policy as well. Um, your policy needs to include several things when you're looking at it, the scope of the library and the collection as a whole, you're looking at it. What's the subject area emphasis? Hopefully as part of the creation of this policy, you're looking at the strengths and weaknesses of the library and trying to figure out what are areas that we need to um, beef up and, and strengthen. Um, you're looking to fill in gaps as you're looking at the curriculum. We're gonna be teaching certain things in the classroom this year what's available in the library to support what we're doing in the classroom. You have to be looking at the demographics of the collection, age levels, reading levels. You're not gonna be having picture books in a high school library in the same way. You're probably not gonna have Faulkner in a K-3 library uh, in an elementary school. Um, you have to have those conversations about how much on fiction versus nonfiction, and, and sometimes what books are we gonna have in the collection that just represent the joy of reading versus what we're gonna have in the collection where kids can actually pull that information out. And the big question always now is digital or versus print and how do we do both and cover the cost of doing that. Um, value, the books that you add should have a clear value, literary, scientific, or artistic, and they should have a level of quality that you don't have feel obligated that you have to explain why this is in the collection. One of the biggest things you have to look at is the budget and the cost of materials. There isn't a library that I know that ever has enough money for collection development. I think they were writing on papyrus about my collection development budget isn't big enough. Um, that's still the case, and budgets um, make libraries have to make choices about what we will and won't add, what we can and can't. And what I mentioned before, space is valuable. And if something's going to be added to these school library shelves, it needs to be something that students want to access and take advantage of. Um, the procedures when you're looking at what should be spelled out in your collection development policy, we recommend certain things that libraries need to take into consideration. First is who is making the selection, and if you have a school librarian, that is an obvious person that would be making those selections uh, to add to that school library. If you don't, you may have to think about who in the school is making those choices and document who that would be. Um, who gives final approval of those purchases? Um, sometimes if you have a school librarian, they have a budget and they'll do it, but a lot of times those purchases have to run across the desk of an administrator to sign off on. You want to make sure you cover that in your policy. Um, you want to make sure you're purchasing, purchasing materials through trusted vendors. Book jobbers are out there. It's not Joe Smith selling books out of the trunk of his car in the parking lot. There are actually uh, book vendors who are there to serve the needs of libraries. Um, you want to make sure uh, you're using authoritative sources of reviews and critique. It is impossible with the number of things that are published today to expect school librarians to read every single book that goes into the collection. So there are a series of highly respected um, journals that are reviewing materials that help make those choices for libraries. Um, and you also are responsible for um, maintaining resources that provide that current awareness, educating uh, the school uh, educators and the school librarians about what's happening in the world, what should we be um, looking at as far as emerging trends, um, new authors, new genres that are going to be appealing to our student body. And the other thing is just how processing works, how purchasing works, uh, along with the selection process is very important. 
once you have this policy in place and you've got community involvement, you've created it, there is, you've identified weaknesses of the collection, areas that you're going to try to build on, you need to include also a reconsideration policy within this collection development. Um, and there are three things that this reconsideration policy should have. One should be, uh, how do you submit a request? Um, what's the review criteria? And then the appeals process, if someone was unhappy with that initial judgment on what to happen with a, a book challenge. Um, reconsideration, challenge policy and procedure. Who may submit the challenge? You should probably spell out, uh, does it need to be an active parent in the school? Does it need to be someone who lives in the school district? Could it be anyone who lives in the state or country could submit a challenge to what you have in that library? You want to make that very clear. Um, the method for submitting the challenge, is it just you come into school and um, have a conversation with the school librarian? We would say no. We would recommend that there's a form that is part of the collection development policy that um, people who are concerned about a title of the book would need to fill out and turn into um, the school district. Um, the procedure uh, for considering a request, is it going to be just the school librarian that does that, or is there going to be a creation of a book reconsideration committee? And if it's a committee, then maybe you have to look at, do they have to meet in a public meeting forum? All of that needs to be addressed when you do that. I think it's very clear you have to. People deserve a time frame. Um, we'll have a response to you in four weeks, six weeks. Uh, it shouldn't feel like you're just throwing your... Um, book uh, reconsideration form into a black hole. Um, the form of the decision at the end of it, we recommend that there's a written response to every book challenge that comes before a school library. And then you have to provide an option for appeal and what that appellate body is going to be. Uh, uh, it could be a specially created appeal um, committee or it could be the school board itself that is going to deal with the appellate. Um, part of that process. And then you need to have, when this is over, at, after the appeal process, clearly stating that's the end. Once we go through uh, the appeals, then this book challenge is, is over. Criteria, when you're looking at for reconsideration, obviously it needs to be lockstep in line with what your collection development policy is. You shouldn't be buying weird things that are far outside of what you've decided you are, your focus is, is going to be in the collection development po policy. They should be appropriately purchased, book jobbers, bookstores. That's the way you should try to go about it. Um, you should, uh, when a person is raising a concern or a challenge, the expectation that they've read the entire book is something that is a reasonable request of the school library to put out there. Um, and I think you, that relates to you have to look at it, uh, the contested content overall as a work, the context of the book. When, when we start to focus on page 89 of a 300-page <coughs> book, that can be very challenging and context does matter. Um, no viewpoint or political belief of the committee um, or the person making the complaint should be the deciding factor in how these reconsiderations are um, looked at. And finally, you have to look at liability. Is there a risk that you take deciding one way or another? And if, if you are just adding books to the collection without addressing the collection development policy, there is a certain risk there. If you're pulling materials from the library without reference to the reconsideration policy or the weeding policy, there are potentially challenges there as well legally. Obscenity is the issue that is a large focus of these challenges. And in the United States and in Michigan, items determined to be obscene are illegal to purchase, to sell or lend, to own. So for an item to be considered obscene and no longer subject to the First Amendment, a court must determine that it's obscene. A school librarian doesn't have the authority to do that. A principal doesn't have the authority to do that. A court has to do that. And there is, they're supposed to use the Miller test, which is the test that goes into place judging what's obscene and what's not obscene. So in closing, again, 
The policy part of this is hugely important, and we encourage school libraries, districts, public libraries to take the creation of these policies very serious. But if you have a well-designed policy, you do and can provide a strong support for the school library um, in providing that safe place for kids to learn and explore and find um, different books that support what else they're learning in their classes at school. Um, well-designed policies also provide students, parents, the community a fair way um, to participate in the building of that collection, to have a voice in what our school library is going to be. And finally, you know, the clear, well-designed policies um, give administrators, teachers, librarians an unbiased, nonpartisan, um, protective way to address challenges and controversies over titles that may be found in their collection. That is in a nutshell and very fast. And there is lots uh, of different areas that we can go into. But if you have questions, that would be great. That, that's a lot of nutshell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's not uh, surprising given the, um, given the topic. Thank you so much. That was really instructive. Uh, Ms. Snyder. Yeah, there's a lot to this, so I have some questions. So a parent has to take a school district to court over a obscene book to be applied by the Miller test in order for it to be not distributed in school libraries? N no. Um, it, it depends. So if a parent has an issue with a book, and whatever that issue is, let's say, you know, for your, your example, let's say the issue was content. You know, the issue is questionable content. Um, the idea is that they would take that follow the procedures outlined by the uh, reconsideration policy. So they would go fill out the form, say, you know, here's the book, here is why I don't think, you know, I have a problem with this book, um, or I have a question about this book, and then the library, you know, would respond. Um, and, and if, you know, there could be many different things. So it could be, let's say maybe there's a question about the age appropriateness of the book. So the, the school or the teacher or the librarian could sit down with the parent and say, okay, well, you know, what is objectionable? And is this something being used in a class? You know, is, could, could there be an opt-out for the parent for the class? So there's, there's many ways to address an issue a parent may have with their child accessing this book that doesn't rise to the level of taking it to court. When, when it would go to court, would be if a parent, say, went to the school and said, I don't want my child seeing it. I don't want anybody else's child seeing it either. I think this book does not belong here. And the school says, goes through their process and says, well, we disagree with you. And we don't find this book to, to be a problem for all of these reasons. And then the parent could then say, could petition a court to say, I would like you know, the court to, to see if this book can be found obscene. Sounds like a really unreasonable process for parents to engage in to um, effectively exercise their constitutional right to direct their children's moral and religious upbringing, right? So that's at the heart of the concept of what is obscene, what is not obscene. You just described a process that's extremely difficult to access and doesn't really provide that constitutional foundation. So I think it would be worth it to revisit that policy and consider whether or not um, the policy is an affront to that constitutional right or if it's truly um, supportive of it. Um, and I would just, you know, throw that out there. I, th I think that's something we need to discuss. Um, well, we I come from a district that has a local policy that says parents don't have the right to opt out. I mean, well, that's like so... So when we have libraries and local policy and school districts that are teaming up against this constitutional right that parents have, it's a real problem. Okay, there's many things to unpack there. Um, so there's, there's um, multiple rights here. <clears throat> so there's the First Amendment right for not only for the child and also for all the other children in the school. And then there is the right of parents to raise their children the way that they feel is best. Right? And that is also a confirmed right under the Constitution. And the First Amendment right um, recognizes that children have a right to access materials 
um, from a wide variety. They have a right to information, right? Information that they want. Now that right can be tempered by different things. So the school has enormous capability to temper that right through curriculum, age appropriateness. Um, and the parents also have enormous ability to temper that right through the family process, through, okay, um, this is what our family believes. This is the kind of thing that I want you to read. These are the kind of things that you know, I do not want you to read. There is a state statute that requires schools to have policies that permit parents to be, you know, to talk to teachers and to um, participate in the process to a reasonable degree. So there, that's required by the statute. So, but in Michigan, every school has home, home rule. So they have different ability to uh, uh, represent that that policy and to uh, abide by that statute. Yeah. I think we're coming up against the wall of to a reasonable extent that um, the State Library Association and local school districts are defining to a reasonable extent is absolutely, in my opinion, a violation of parental rights to bring up their children in their own moral and religious ideas. It's also just an overall issue in terms of usurping the rights of parents in general. Well, so, so to the, so to your point, though, you know, you could be a parent of a child that wants to say, "No, I don't want my my child to have access to that that those books." Mm -hmm. But you could also be a parent that, if you agree with those books, take them to a public public library and give them access to it. So, so right. when we say to a reasonable extent, I would employ all of you that to a reasonable extent might look like um, if we really want to not usurp parental rights then we wouldn't be asking them to jump through 10 hoops to encourage obscene books to be taken off of shelves. Well, well, we would say, you know what? Go to the public library, because our tax dollars pay for a large breadth of information and materials out there. If parents want their children to have access to that, have at it. Well, first of all, it's the school curriculum and the school collection development policy that determines what gets purchased in the library. So if there's something in the library that <clears throat> someone disagrees with, it's not there just because it's there. It's there because someone decided that there was a reason to have it there under the curriculum. Um, <clears throat> it's not, a, if you as a parent object to that, then there should be, according to state law, a way for you to work with your school. Okay? And, and we don't, have the authority to tell school libraries or public libraries what they can and can't collect. Sure, That's why a lot of our focus is on the creation of those policies that are going to set those guide rails right. in place. Is, because the process of policy makes a difference in local school districts. By not pushing back to the reasonable extent, right, the definition of what that means, then we really don't take a stand in the ways in which we should for the constitutional rights that parents have. And again, if if I wasn't going through this in my own local school district, then I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't see that that's why your policies matter. They really do matter. To a reasonable extent, if you don't stand for that and, and you don't usurp parents' rights, then you don't see local school districts saying, we're going to just say sexuality and gender identity are topics that you don't get to opt out of. But that's what local school districts are doing in the state of Michigan. Your policy right. matters. Right. Part of the problem is, as Randy said, we don't have the authority to enforce any policy to any school as far as their library is concerned. I can only tell you that there are two statutes under the state education code that require schools to work with parents on these things. Um, I can also tell you that when you use the word obscene, it's very sticky because it's, it's well known in different um, Supreme Court decisions is that what's obscene to one person is not obscene to another. That's why it's got to go to a court. And one parent and one family can't determine for an entire school what's appropriate and what's not for every student. So that's why it has to be dealt with on the individual parent level. But and when we're, working, I, when we're working with a lot of public libraries and school libraries, um, you know, I've seen enough of the board meetings on YouTube that it's, it's not a pleasant experience. And what we're trying to say is we're focusing on how you create those policies and that communication with your community because that matters beforehand. And it's very obvious in a lot of those YouTube board meetings, it's the first time those people have ever seen each other mm -hmm. and had a conversation often. And that's unfortunate. But through the conversations that can happen by 
properly or trying new ways of having some conversations about how we're going to come up with what this library is going to look like and be, I think having some of those conversations makes some of the, the, the temperature in the room go down a bit and it not be such a hot conversation. And I think on both sides, we need to work at doing that better. Yes, and when you say both sides, to be clear, we're asking individual parents, one side of this, what, what you're talking about, individual parents are supposed to bring their right, equal right, to access to education on behalf of their kids through a 10-step jumping through hoops process it, it, to protect their rights. It, that is really what we've just described here. It doesn't have to be a 10-step. But it is. It, well, again, it depends on the individual school district. Yeah. I can tell you any library professional, whether a public library professional or a school library professional, should be more than welcoming of parent to approach them and say, can you explain to me why this book is on the shelf? And can you explain to me why you think this is appropriate for my child? That's a great conversation, but they simply have a right. They shouldn't have to go to a librarian and say, can you explain to me? There's a right that they have from a parent's perspective and an equal access right that that child has to education. So if they opt out of sex education or reproductive health education, and that book is right in their kid's face as soon as they walk into the library, when, by the way, it could be in a public library for another parent to access easily, or that parent could purchase it on their behalf or rent it from another location, you're actually standing by this idea that that parent and that child have to fight for their rights to the equal access to education. That's not okay. But not every parent, not every parent has the ability to take their kid to go buy a book or to go take their kid to the public library or, you know, it's, we're also talking, you know, we're talking about two different spheres here. You have the school sphere where they choose materials based on criteria and you have the public library sphere. One doesn't necessarily substitute for the other. I mean, we don't put pornography on shelves because parents might not be able to transport their kids to public libraries. To well, get it. again, pornography, we don't do that. what is pornography to one person isn't pornography for something else, someone else. This all gets very individual. Yeah, there, there, you just there, said I, I appreciate that, and I, I appreciate the back and forth, but it isn't a conversation. It's a board meeting, and so we're going to um, reestablish the fact that it's a board meeting. If people have questions, they can come through the, um, through the chair. I appreciate the back and forth. I think it's been instructive, um, but I also think that there are other board members here who may want to uh, share a reflection or, um, or two. Other board members? Uh, Ms. McMillan. So if a parent of a child in middle school uh, finds a book in a library that they feel is inappropriate and the, dis the, the district goes through the process and they say, yeah, you're right, it's, we're going to rem remove it, would you say that the s district is banning that book? Um, it's, it's allowed in the high school. Right. It's not allowed in the middle schools. Are they banning the book? I think some people would say they are. I, I think some of that depends on, on the process that was followed and the, and the criteria used to determine whether the book was appropriate or not. So you wouldn't think that they are just making an age-appropriate decision and saying it shouldn't be in the middle school, it can be in the high school? They could be. Well, I mean, this is, uh, you know, parents that are objecting are being told that they are book banners. Do you agree with that? Again, I think it's really hard to throw generalizations around. I think in well, every, in done. every, well, yeah, it's hap it happens on both on all sides of so this. I'd like question. to know what you think, yes or no. Is are they book banners for simply objecting to a book? Yes or no? I would say <laughs> um, a parent is not a book banner for objecting to a book. A, a parent could be described as a book banner if they're if they're trying to get a book removed for everybody based on that family's own personal viewpoint. Well, but I mean, if the district agrees to it, I, you know, just, um, I, I would appreciate if uh, people like the Library Association would, would not encourage the inflaming of these and attacks on parents who have just legitimate, you know, and, and it's certainly coming from the left, um, that they, you know, don't um, don't call these people book banners. They're simply looking out for their kids, and it just is unfortunate that society's gotten to the point 
where it gets this heated and um, just because parents care about their kids. Um, thank you, Mr. McMillan. Uh, Dr. Uh, Pugh and then Dr. Robinson. Um, thank you all for, for coming. Um, this presentation has been a long time uh, in the making and just really appreciate you all coming uh, and trying to um, break up some of the mis and purposefully disinformation uh, that has been put out there. Um, you know, being called a book banner is, is a lot nicer than some of the things that I've been called and, and fellow board members have been called for defending uh, our children, being able to see books that reflect themselves. Um, for being, and that's that's inclusive of books like, uh, and authors like Toni Morrison, uh, authors like uh, Maya Angelou, um, uh, or the 1619 Project. You know, th there are a lot of books that, because we've defended those books being on the shelves, books that help, uh, again, children to see themselves, but also books that help to address um, very complex uh, issues uh, in and in a classroom setting with, with educators and um, or within a library that's in a classroom setting. And so I, I again, I appreciate you all coming and explaining what the policies uh, can be, what they should be, um, helping us to be able to explain that and stand very firm on those explanations as th that is what my response has been to parents that have come to me because no one at this table wants to exclude parents, especially parents from making individual decisions about their children. Uh, again, where it does get dicey is where uh, we're trying to determine what a child should be able to read and what they shouldn't be able to read. Um, and again, when we're talking about, about books, that a lot of times are talking about my history and, and the history of a people. And wanting Nobody to- wants to ban those books. Give <laughs> well, me a break. Uh, they have banned the them. The red herring is pathetic. You know what? You know what? She's speaking. I, yeah, she but has she, the floor. yeah, but it's pathetic. You, you know what? You can say it's pathetic she outside. She's a child killer, okay? So you didn't have a problem with that. With respect, you don't have the floor. Let's go. You're not going to keep calling me pathetic. That's the second time. No, I time didn't say you, you were. I said the you idea. You called me pathetic. I said, no, twice. I didn't. I said the idea is. So um, I'm wondering hair. how are we sharing this um, information? Um, and then how, I, I was just thinking, I was at a MS, MASB conference just over the weekend. Uh, do boards, are, are you all able to get this information to other boards at the local level where it is playing out? In, in, in uh, volatile ways often. Yeah, I mean, we're working closely. I mean, and, and I mean, obviously, book challenges, it's a huge issue. It's, it's happening in a lot of places. And we have actively been trying to work with school libraries, public libraries. Do you have policies in place? And I mean, I'll tell you, some places it's been several years since they've updated their collection development policy. And we've said, you know, that's, that's inexcusable. You have to regularly be on top of this. So we've been working with, you need to be working with that. We're, you know, working with uh, Michigan Associate of School Librarians. We regularly have conversations with them, with MLA, with public libraries. Yeah, we're, we're at the table having those conversations and there are a lot of them and a few of us, and we try to, as much as we can, go and make those direct visits and look at what's happening and um, offer as much advice as they'll take, I mean, in a mm -hmm. local control state. But yeah, we're, we're having conversations with all the library groups across the state about the need for making sure um, you're not just randomly mm -hmm. doing your collection development. There has to be a, a structured way that that takes place. Uh, and if it's not, that's a problem. And, you know, if you don't have a collection development policy and you're just buying things based on what you mm -hmm. like, then you're going to have a really hard time if books are challenged because there's got to be more than what I like or what I think kids need to read as the, the basis of what you're buying and bringing into school libraries. I was at the Michigan Association of School Libraries 
conference a couple weeks ago presenting a, a very similar presentation to them with one of my colleagues. Please. Just one more question, um, hopefully. The, you know, my, my parents used to tell me don't take the advice of sidewalk counselors. <laughs> and there have been um, folks who have been sending parents into schools with these, you know, made up threats and, um, you know, telling them to take schools through, um, drag them through legal processing. And we know that a lot of that was by design to uh, keep schools on their heels. Have you heard how that has been um, obstructing um, schools as a whole and maybe pulling, having them pull books off the shelves? Has that, do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. I, I, I mean, it's taken a lot of, there's a lot of challenges out there. It's gobbling up a lot of, of time for a school library and school administrators, administrators addressing that issue. Um, but in saying that, I think sometimes there are very legitimate concerns by some of these parents about what's happening in schools and what books, and I would never say right. you can't. But that's what you're talking about. You're talking about that. You're talking about the process for the legitimate concerns here. Yeah, I guess, but I mean, you have, I mean, I mean, I'm, uh, we're stressed. I mean, the conversations need to be happening. Yeah. And I think it's very obvious yes. that parents and school librarians and school administrators talking about mm -hmm. this is not a bad thing. I don't know what the structure of that's going to be, but I just know personal opinion when you're looking at what's happening in some of those board meetings, that's not it. That's not the solution necessarily. It's, it's making people um, very defensive on both sides, and, and I'm not sure we're getting to the place we need to get to. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Doc, thank you, Dr. Pugh. Dr. Robinson, Ms. Snyder. So I think one of the, the big bright lines here is should parents have the right to object to materials for their children versus should parents have the right to object to materials for everyone's children, right? And I think I heard a board member say earlier that the school district that their children attended did not allow opt-out? Correct. Okay. That's Dexter? Um, I, yes, it is Dexter. Okay. Here's they the have Dexter, policy. Here's the Dexter opt-out policy. I will send it to you right now. I'll pull it up Happy and read to look it to at you. It. So here it talks about the board uh, does allow opt-outs for materials except for state-mandated testing which is an interesting <laughs> carve out. Um, it's board policy 2416. Um, and it also talks about recourse, um, both with the Department of Education, Privacy Acts, FERPA, et cetera. So I, I don't think that every kid needs to see every book in a school library. And frankly, I'm glad that we have two children that graduated from a terrific public school system. And I feel fortunate that they didn't need some of the books that are in the library, but I'm really grateful that those books are there for the kids that do need them. And so I, will, I would fight to the last straw for a parent to have the right to opt their child out of certain materials that they find objectionable, but I will also fight to make sure that those materials are available for kids who, who need them and see themselves in them and are reflected in them. So the, the only other thing I would say is that I really appreciate the work that you're all doing. I know it's under a great deal of pressure. Um, and I think a lot of teachers and librarians across the state and across the country, for that matter, um, appreciate your courage. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Robinson. You. Ms. Snyder. So here's the language that you're not pulling up. It says, courses, comma, that may include human sexuality, gender identity, or any of the core concepts outlined above do not constitute sex education and would not be subject to the legal requirements, dot, 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 dot. Okay, human sexuality and gender identity are absolutely core concepts of sex education. We're not going to sit here and pretend like it isn't. Um, this is a live issue. There's no doubt that there's many more years to come of debate around it and that the underpinning of it is the usurpation of parental rights. And it's not just something that's happening at our board table or local board tables around our state or even the nation. It's something that the Supreme Court has already entertained in other states with other court cases. Um, here is some uh, law from Duke that, that describes the issue. In essence, then, the question is what happens when parents seek to be both insiders and outsiders. If a goal of public education is to expose 
to diverse views, then ushering those with minority viewpoints to the exit is counter counterproductive. To what extent can a purportedly liberal education system refuse to accommodate minority views without betraying its liberal label? That's at the center of what we're talking about right now. The concept that parents have to jump through 10 hoops to demonstrate what we might consider a minority view because we can't withhold um, materials that are also available in other arenas for parents to access on their own time for children in order to honor the totality of the parental right to bring your child up in the moral and religious upbringing that you so choose. It's shocking that we can't understand that, you know, this isn't about sidewalk counselors or misinformation or attacking one another. There really is something at the center of this that's worth peeling back the layers to because this is, it's not reasonable for a parent to have to jump through 10 different hoops to say, gosh, maybe pornography shouldn't be on the shelves. Okay, thank you, Ms. Snyder. Uh, Mr. Bullock. I have questions of curiosity. I believe the Supreme Court's already ruled on many of those issues that were just stated by several people here. Uh, do we know how many cases of or challenges has happened over the last, like each year, how many cases have happened and how many times has a book been removed from, from that case? Uh, you mean nationwide or, no, no, or Michigan? Michigan? Like, so somebody, you know, you got 13 challenges in Wayne County how many times has the book been removed because of the challenge? It's a curiosity question for me. Every case I know of, which would be cases that are reported, which is not every case. Because they don't make it to a case because right. they go talk to the school. and they, Or they, they don't make it to a level of court where the opinion's actually like, there's actually a real opinion that's yeah. filed. Um, every case that, I've, that I know of, and there's not a lot of them, um, even if the lower court uh, has, has removed the book, the higher court, the Court of Appeals, uh, has rescinded it. Um, so almost always the book is returned to the shelf. I, I actually don't know of a case where it had not been. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bullock. Other board members? Other board members? You referenced a, uh, a ranking of Michigan relative to public librarians, I believe. It was 46th in the nation. Having school number of school librarians. Tell us a little bit, just, just if you have a, a 30 seconds or 60 seconds on that. I mean, I think uh, school districts have a lot of hard budget choices. And in a lot of cases, one of the easy go-to places to sort of shrink the budget is looking at library staff. And, and that's happened. It used to be a hard decision. It's an easier decision now because every other district around you may have already done that. I mean, I, and still the national average, I think, is a one teacher librarian to a thousand kids, which is, is not a great number in itself. But in Michigan, it's one teacher librarian to 2,500 kids, mm -hmm. which is it's significant, and in a lot of places, I think when we're having book challenges, if there was a certified teacher librarian who was managing that collection, there might have been some of this um, confusion or anger could have been dealt with in a different way. It's just that in a lot of schools, the library is a place, but it might have a mom that comes in two afternoons a week to circulate books or or they don't have anyone in there, I think that adds to some of the challenges of what are happening. But yeah, Michigan is losing school librarians um, at a fairly steady rate, but it's happening nationally too. We're not alone in that. Uh, just it seems to be happening faster in Michigan and some other states. So more than double the student librarian ratio nationally. Yeah. 46th in the nation in terms of that ratio. And these are people who, um, if they do their job well, and they often do, serve as literacy leaders yeah. in a school. They help you not only with collection development, collection pruning, collection uh, appeals, um, individual uh, discrete issues about an individual discrete book, but they also help you with literacy. 
Right. And I, this is something that uh, we've been challenged by and with um, in our state for many years. Um, a, a number of us have had the good fortune to grow up and spend our entire lives in the great state of Michigan. Some of us are recent transplants. We've only been here for a third of our lives. Um, for those of us who have lived elsewhere, we may have experienced, in my case, did experience um, districts with a lot of librarians. We had a librarian in every one of my elementary schools in a low-tax, low-spend jurisdiction in northern New Jersey, 14 elementary schools, 14 librarians. When I came to Michigan, my school district of 17 elementaries had two librarians in it. So you reflect upon that a little bit. Um, we were more fortunate in terms of per pupil funding in Michigan than in New Jersey, in terms of where we were in the state. But across state, New Jersey funded its schools much better than did Michigan. And you saw it in all sorts of things, like, for example, librarians, like, for example, nurses. You had talked about helping professionals Social earlier. So I think you're right. But I think the decision to get rid of librarians was a budget decision that was made years and years ago. And now we are, we are living with the adverse impact of that. I don't know that there are tremendous numbers of active decisions about that. I think in many cases those decisions are 8, 10, 12, 15 years, 20 years old. And in some districts they don't even remember having a librarian. I went into one school district, I think this, this bears mentioning, went into one school district my first year. They opened up the library, they unlocked the library so that we could meet there. Uh, Dr. Edwards and Dr. Chapman, you were in that library and that school district with me just a few weeks ago. A child asked me in the meeting, he said, Dr. Rice, what do you think about a school district <clears throat> that opens up its libraries only when guests come? Think about that. You cannot promote literacy with your books locked up or with volunteers and only volunteers running your libraries. Now, I'm all about volunteers, but not volunteers exclusively to manage collections. That's something that professionals ought to do. I love books, but that doesn't mean I should manage a collection of public books. My own is a different story. But public books, that takes experience and, and, and education and knowledge. So I just share some of those reflections because sometimes we lose a lot in the number. I love numbers. You know, it's catnip to me. But at the end of the day, sometimes a story or two helps really paint a picture of what our kids are getting eye level every single day. Dr. Reyes? Yeah, please. Um, when they, when a parent challenges a book, don't they have to say why they're challenging it? Yeah, normally. Okay. Have you ever in the last 10 years seen anybody challenge a book because of the skin color in, in, of pictures or anything in the book? Um, not a specific book. Okay. But I, I mean, I, anybody who's thrown out red herrings probably ought dangerous. to bring that to us and mm -mm. show us. I'd Me like too. to see it. Mm -mm. I don't think it's that. I don't think it has. And if it, if it did, I'd be a tough problem with the two. Everybody would. She just said no. It's, she answered. it's not out there. They can't come up with some. Um, just try to cover things up usually. Um, do you want the floor? Races a lot of times try to cover things up. It's not overtly out there that, hey, yeah, this is racism. We're doing this because you're black. That's why um, people used to put hoods on their heads. So, well, I, so I may object to a book, say *The Bluest Eye* by Toni Morrison, or *I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings* by Maya Angelou, ostensibly on the grounds of 
uh, violence or um, sexual abuse or, 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 but in fact, I may be unnerved by the characters in the book. Yes. Okay, thank and, you. And, and, and Board Member Bullock, I don't know if you were in the Senate, maybe, I don't know, that was le less than two years ago. There was all types of censorship mm -hmm. legislation where educators, no matter what role you were playing, um, were being told that you could be the cause of your district losing percentages of dollars that came out of out of the um, the classroom yeah. and out of your district. And you talked about when you're under those threats, you don't know what to do. So you just that's like don't say gay. That's like you know, let's let's put away the books um, that that's what's the the laws down in Florida. It's no different. Um, when you have, so it's not just uh, what I'm talking, it's what I know. And no, someone may not show up and say that it's because of um, the color of someone's skin that they don't want that book, but they will say it's unpatriotic to talk about people who have a certain skin color and because of that skin color have gone through uh, slavery and other um, forms of oppression. So that is very true, and it's on the books. It's it's legislation. It's some, I mean, sometimes there have been, um, I don't know, biographies of African Americans that, um, you know, you may see as history, and someone else may see as critical race theory. So there have been some questions mm -hmm. that way. Um, and critical race theory. So her point that. is <laughs> in, in the Senate. Critical race theory, if you voted for it, you lost, you would lose your funding if you mm -hmm. voted against what was proposed yeah. by a group. Mm -hmm. So, but then there are other things. I mean, I literally saw a black face show on the steps of the Capitol, but it was never reported out. I actually had the video and show people a black face show on the, some children, mm -hmm. the parents put their children on the stairs of the Capitol in opposition to a virus and put on a Sammy Davis Jr. blackface show with Obama and Hillary Clinton's mask on and no one ever reported it. We had inter internal conversations about it, but it never hit the media. The media was there. So when you say that what's not there, we're telling you as black people, everything that happens, whether you feel it or not, we do. Those things are real. Privilege is real. We don't we're see talking, it all. The we're time. talking about book burning. Yeah. I'm not I mean, talking about book burning. Banning. I'm talking, we're talking about, about book we're banning. We're talking about what's in a book, what someone feels is offensive to them, but the other nine thousand parents in the school district don't 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 have a problem with that one book, but you do. So we should shut it all down because you feel some type of way. Opt your kid out and follow the process. We're talking about obscene books. The, you even, however you, you feel even about were shocked it. by it, what I showed you. Yeah, man. You were yeah, outraged man. by what I showed you. But they are. They're fine with it. I wasn't outraged. I just thought you were crazy for putting it up. No. Okay. okay. But tell them that. Tell them it's crazy that it's put up. Because no, that's what I'm they're not putting it on the, the shelf. Image. He's just being yeah. provocative. Yeah, he's it's, it's David he's Stern. Him. He's shocking he's us at a table on. where you shouldn't show well, let me the foolishness. Can I just wrap us up here? Are we not... You guys not doing this. We all agree Stop. that books that are racist should not be on shelves. We should be That's have access. That's not how it started. He started with the red herring about something she said. And there are books that people are opposed to because black people are in them, whether I'm it's subtle. That. So don't uh, don't fall into the trap and aid him in his crap. No, no, no. I think the okay. trap here it, is that we aren't together on the great. fact that parents have the right. And the kids have a right to learn. And they have a right. They have a constitutional right. And it's been judged several times in the federal court. It's yeah. been judged over and over in the Supreme Court that because the constitutional rights, freedom of information, freedom of speech, all of these things work, except when you don't want them to. So that is that's stop. not fair. And I just will say this. It hasn't gone to the highest level. It, can go it has to, several it times. You know, you know what? It's it's three fifteen, and Having a conversation. Um, we we will we will stay with bated breath for the next uh, court decision on this. In the meantime, as a rule, the courts have seen fit, as a rule, to provide broad access to literature 
um, in libraries across the state and across the country, and they, they, I hope, will continue to do so. Thank you very much for your presentation. We Thank appreciate you. you. Thank you. Take good care. Um, board, it is uh, 3.15, and we're at the report of the state board president. Okay. I was hoping that I could find legislation, but I'll, I will bring that back um, later. Um, next month, I'll try and bring a compilation of <clears throat> travels through the state and some of the wonderful, wonderful things that are going on across the state. Um, um, Board Member Lifton, you would be happy to know that I was in Saginaw and we were celebrating our Saginaw Promise. I thought of you. Had I known a little bit earlier, I definitely would have invited you also as a Saginaw resident, but as a member of the State Board of Education. Um, I had the opportunity to go to the ribbon cutting ceremony uh, for um, one of three projects that, that we will see in Saginaw, um, in the city of Saginaw through Saginaw Public School District. And it was the ceremony, um, ribbon cutting ceremony and open house for um, Hanley Elementary School. So really excited about that. And hopefully uh, we can invite you to maybe about the second or the third uh, iteration of how we are structuring um, our school system to provide um, better instruction and better opportunities for, for children in Saginaw and, and would love to have you all be a part of that. I think I mentioned before that I was going to be participating in the Right to Read convening and um, we'll bring more information on that also um, next month, but that was held in Detroit. We talked about uh, the Detroit right to literacy case, but we also talked about, um, I think Dr. Rice, as you talk about it, um, getting into the whys and the hows of, of reading. So uh, peeling back this science of reading, um, as well as all the other um, pieces that we know that have to go into um, drawing our children and making sure that they want to read. So having that conversation in Detroit, and I will, again, bring more information about that. Um, I was honored, and I was surprised. I guess I wasn't supposed to be, but I was uh, surprised on October 22nd. I was bestowed the Dr. Ralph J. Bunch Humanitarian Award by the United Nations Association um, of the United States of America, and it was the Greater Detroit Chapter. So it was Dr. Uh, Kamara Jones and I, who is an epidemiologist and a well-regarded uh, physician um, and public health uh, expert. And so we were um, honored for our work, which is considered to uphold the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so the award is in the name of Dr. Ralph Bunch. Uh, Dr. Ralph Bunch was the first African-American and person of color to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. And he received the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in negotiating the 1949 Armistice Agreement between Israel and four, four Arab state states. Uh, when I got the award, and it's a beautiful award, um, but, you know, I, and I've written this and I've written a statement, but it was on the day, um, unfortunately, uh, that marked the one month marker of the Hamas attack on Israel. And um, along with um, all the work that all of us do for children um, and just looking at how this has impacted the lives of children, this war, um, I, I would be remiss if I would celebrate this humanitarian award at the time that we're seeing this impact people, not just in Israel and Palestine, but also um, families here in Michigan and the fact that our children are watching this unfold and we're seeing more and more children and particularly children uh, in Palestine who, um, who are being killed at, at a rate higher than any rate that we've seen in any modern day war. And so just reflecting on that as I was also um, getting this, this award, um, and just, again, trying to make sure that I'm promoting in whatever way possible um, peace um, and uh, continuing to think about uh, the families and children 
who are across seas, but also um, those families and family members of Palestinians, as well as those families in Israel who's, who's still captured, the over 200 people. Um, and I reflected on that in, in a statement that was written. So I um, just wanted to um, celebrate that award, but um, uh, also bring to light, uh, as we all know, and we are watching unfold, that there are people who, who are suffering uh, abroad and in this country as a result of, of what's happening there. So that is my report, and I will bring more, hopefully, with pictures next uh, month. Thank you, Dr. Pugh. Report of the state superintendent will be brief, given um, our uh, earlier sharing uh, by Dr. Carnell and me. Three thoughts. First, I appreciate the opportunity to attend the governor's tribal state summit late last month, the convening of the governor with leaders of the 12 tribes in the state and state agency heads. As always, I appreciate the opportunity to interact with tribal leaders and to learn from them and from members of our Indigenous Education Initiative, Ms. Melissa Isaac and Ms. Jennifer LaPointe. Second, I wanted to give a shout out to those celebrating Native American Heritage Month. The governor recently declared November Native American Heritage Month in Michigan. And finally, um, I promised earlier that I would share two communications with you regarding the AP letters that we recently sent to parents of students whose PSAT test results indicated likely success in advanced placement work. First communication was from a dad who wrote me the following. Dr. Rice, thanks for sending this letter. It meant a great deal to my daughter and to our family. Second communication, almost as succinct, was from an aunt of a student, she wrote, my sister received this letter for her daughter. Her daughter sometimes doesn't have all the confidence. This brought tears to my sister and her. She will be taking an AP class second semester. What you do has impact. Um, and I would say, board, what you do has impact as well. Board, it's 322. Before we move on, I have a question in your section yep. on, on the report of grant awards. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. So I was just looking at that, and um, I just would like, you don't need to mention it now, but if I can understand better, number seven and number eight were um, 14 million to Baldwin Community Schools, who has 455 students for behavioral health providers, and the same district got 33 million for teen health centers. So that's over $100,000 per student. I'm sure they must be distributing it or something, but they I would are. like they're to understand. As, they're serving as fiscal agent. Okay, I'd uh, like to understand how that, and then like the, an administrative cut that they get or something. Sure. And then also the Gary B, I saw that, the 94 million. I'm hoping that we'll be able to see how that's used, um, kind of detail reports in the future. You bet. Just a note on the 94, uh, I understand the first question, we'll get you something on that one. On, on, the, on the Gary B funding, the $94.4 million, there's a process that's established within state statute, within the fiscal year 24 budget. We'll share that um, in board brief with you. That process is ongoing. Yeah. We just met with right. the state superintendent and state su uh, <laughs> yeah, local superintendent, local superintendent's team, and shared a little bit about uh, process. And he shared a little bit about where they were with process. They've, they are mired in process with respect to those uh, dollars. They've, they've yet to spend them because right. the, the statute requires sure. um, a fair bit of community engagement sure. prior to recommendations coming from the community to the, the superintendent and then determinations of that local superintendent, that local school board about how to spend sure. that money. So it's very much in, in process. But we're happy to share a little bit of that. We'll share the statute. I was thinking a year from now or whenever it, well, they're I think starting to use it. You bet. And, and, and actually, if I recall the statute correctly, they have until 27 to oh. spend that funding. Oh, okay. So they've okay. got a fair bit of time okay. to, to spend those dollars down. But yes, we'd be happy to share. Thank you. Yep. Please. Um, to, to that point, just so you know, um, Tom, I've asked and we've had several community members from all faculty community. Um, who have 
wanted to know a little bit better around what's going to happen with the community information that's being collected and how that's going to um, impact what happens. And so hoping that we can follow up on, on that as well. I know we've talked you about bet. that. We have talked about yes. that. And um, that, that, that may require a field trip. Yes. 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 So that's what I'm trying to allude to here okay. without... Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Very good. Thank you both. Um, board members, next item on today's agenda is a presentation on the report of the Teachers of the Year. Ms. Candace Jackson, current Michigan Teacher of the Year, is a third grade teacher at Mann Learning Community in Detroit Public Schools Community District. Ms. Jackson is joined by Ms. Stephanie Nielsen, who teaches kindergarten at Shawmut Hills Academy in Grand Rapids Public Schools and is uh, quite startled by uh, being among us today. Uh, we welcome Ms. Jackson and Ms. Nielsen to present their report. This is an informational presentation. No board action is required. No test will be administered. Teachers of the Year, welcome. Thank you. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm used to talking to five-year-olds, so if you could all just like <laughs> spin around on your heads and do some things that make me feel more comfortable. <laughs> um, but no, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm grateful to have a seat at the table and believe strongly in the voices of teachers. I'm proud to represent Grand Rapids Public Schools and my building, Shawmut Hills Academy, on the west side of Grand Rapids. This is my 16th year teaching and my 12th year with Grand Rapids Public Schools. I've taught preschool, kindergarten, first grade, third grade, fourth grade, and I'm also the proud um, chair of our garden at our school um, and I'm also the proud mom of my 10 year old daughter our two rescue dogs proud partner daughter sister and friend to my loved ones who I share all of my greatest Michigan adventures with so today I'm looking forward to talking with you about place-based education um, a topic that's near and dear to my heart I believe strongly um, also in explicit literacy instruction. I am halfway through my letters training. I am part of the cohort that's rolling out the early math essentials with MESA, um, but I also believe in environmental literacy. Um, so our building began using this model school-wide with the help of our district environmental education consultant a few years ago with hopes to increase enrollment and scholar achievement, and just to distinguish ourselves as a high quality neighborhood school, and we believe it's working. Um, so pictured here, you'll see one of my kindergarten students a few years ago, and um, she was out on a hawk walk, as we call it, at Shawmut. Our mascot is the Red Hawks, and so when we began going on these schoolyard walks um, to learn more about our place, our second grade teacher coined this term hawk walk, and so now we have preschool through eighth graders who go on hawk walks and our feeder high school, Union High, has started using this term as well. Um, and so this is just a fun approach to learning, especially at the kindergarten level. I love this quote, wisdom begins in wonder, um, because if our scholars are to um, have that wisdom that we all want them, that we're striving for, we do need to make sure they have opportunities to bond with their environment, and that begins with joy and wonder. Um, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land that we're on. I'm a Michigan girl through and through, and I'm proud to represent Region 3. It spans the 13 counties of West Michigan. I was born and raised in a little one stoplight town up north in the northernmost um, county of Region 3, Mason County. And I have special roots in Lake County where my family cabin is. And I've resided in Grand Rapids and Kent County for the last 15 years. I adore Michigan's rural spaces just as much as its urban spaces throughout our great state. So with that love in my heart, it's important to me that we acknowledge respectfully acknowledge that we are on the ancestral and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples, that we continue to seek to understand the history that has brought us to reside on this land and the forced separation of Michigan's indigenous communities, and that we celebrate the sovereignty of the indigenous communities who continue to reside in the Lansing area.
So I'll start just by talking a little bit about what place-based education is. There are a lot of P's in education. So um, my STEM is advocating and um, putting out efforts uh, with a 3P model right now. And part of that, one of the three P's is place-based education. There's also project based learning, which the acronym is usually PBL for that. And then there's problem-based learning. Um, but place-based education is instruction that connects scholars to their local place through experiential and hands-on activities in which issues and strengths of the community are investigated and explored. It just makes learning more relevant for scholars. Um, it occurs in schoolyards, neighborhoods, cities, and the community as a whole. Learning is made as local as possible so that scholars can use it to understand larger, more global contexts as they get older. Um, over the past few years, our community has developed more outdoor gathering spaces. So in this photo, you'll see me reading a book in one little nook of our schoolyard that the scholars have named Spruce Camp because it's surrounded by uh, several spruce trees. And we've just found a lot of value in allowing scholars to name the spaces throughout our grounds. So place-based education approaches instruction through many best practices. Some of them um, are outlined here by Teton Science Schools, um, that there's a local to global context, that it's learner-centered, that it's inquiry-based, involves design thinking, that we're using our communities as classrooms, and that it uses an interdisciplinary approach. Um, some of the largest benefits I've seen are the cross-curricular connections made when engaging in this work. Um, pictured here, our, scholar, uh, our scholars are getting to know their community on walks downtown Grand Rapids. They're at our local museum. You'll also see them in the schoolyard measuring snow, measuring rainfall, exploring our school garden, and journaling outdoors. Um, some cross-curricular and cross-grade level projects that we've uh, had in our building recently are adding murals to our schoolyard, creating a tree tour for community visitors to see when they come by the park in our schoolyard, designing native pollinator gardens, We've established our grounds as a monarch way station, um, hosting community garden events, weather studies, and lots more. So a key component to place-based education is making sure we have community partners. These partnerships bring expertise to our scholars and the organiza organizations are also more likely to thrive with that school involvement. This is one of our community partners, the Outdoor Discovery Center. They're providing a schoolyard field trip where they brought their raptor birds to us mm -hmm. to see close up. Um, as I mentioned, our mascot is a red hawk. So seeing a real one up close was uh, very exciting for our kindergartners. Um, so they also know how to um, identify red hawks now <coughs> when they fly over our playground, which is exciting, but also a little nerve wracking for me. <laughs> um, and we also got to go on a bird walk with Joy here, who took us around with real nice binoculars, not like the little ones that we have in our classroom, which was really exciting for our scholars. They felt like real scientists and um, observers. Uh, this past weekend, I had the privilege to present and attend the Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative's Place-Based Education Conference. It was an incredible celebration of educators, researchers, authors, and more. Um, I'm very grateful for our GLSI Hub Groundswell for sponsoring my attendance. And here, GLSI has defined some of the benefits of place-based education as increased academic achievement on standardized assessments, sharpened critical thinking skills, um, those cross-curricular connections that I mentioned, having a positive community impact, an increased agency, and opportunities for career path options. Uh, I keep this quote by David Sobel at the end of my email signature as a reminder that time spent in our communities and nature is never lost. It says, if we want children to flourish, to become truly empowered, let us allow them to love the earth before we ask them to save it. 
So I think we'll be asking this next generation of scholars to solve a lot of issues in our future. And um, I believe a critical bond with nature and the community is necessary for them to engage in that work. And I believe that place-based education will support us in that effort. As you know, our, our toy team has been collaborating on a social emotional learning toolkit. So the social emotional health of our scholars has been at the forefront of our minds. And in regards to place-based education and SEL, when scholars engage with nature and the outdoors and their communities, they're usually less stressed. They have a greater, greater sense of well-being and identity. They have more positive interactions with others and overall better critical thinking skills. Scholars have a greater sense of agency and empowerment by participating in place-based experiences where they get to be the change makers in their space. Um, some things I've noticed is that my students are just more joyful. Teachers are usually more joyful and less stressed. Once they get the hang of taking kids outside, um, they're happier having gotten outdoors and gotten some sunshine and some fresh air. Um, we also see more parent involvement through this work. And I, I think it helps with the attendance. I don't have any data points to speak to that, but I think kids are more excited to come to school when they are looking forward to engaging in projects that are place-based. Um, this is also a great book that talks about some of the social emotional um, benefits and it also talks about designing schools with mental health in mind. So I would just highly recommend that read. Um, so before I pass things off to Candace, I'd just like to note the importance of providing experiences like this for all of the scholars in our state, not just those who attend environmental schools or in their high school biology class or nature schools, but that access to the outdoors and our communities is a basic human right. All children in neighborhood, both urban and rural public schools deserve that access and place-based education is best practice. I'm confident if implemented more widely with less barriers to educators, it would only benefit our scholars and our communities as a whole. So thank you so much for your time. I do have lots of references there and um, more books I could recommend if you're interested or have any more questions. So I was very excited that Stephanie decided to do place-based education because environmental education and place-based education is very important to me. One of the ways that I'm able to do it in an urban area is through the use of field trips. Um, I think it's important to dissolve the walls of your classroom and use the community as a greater classroom. And one of the partnerships that I've been able to make was with the University of Michigan Environmental Interpretive Center. My school is on the southwest border of Detroit. So right around the corner is U of M Dearborn, and they have about 120 acres of environmental study area. And so it's part of my third grade curriculum when we're studying birds, we can go to the Environmental Interpretive Center and we can go on a bird walk. When we're studying squirrels, we can go out into the yard and we can take a look at the habitats around the school, but also at the Environmental Interpretive Center. I think taking these urban field trips it's a way to provide relevant exposure to the students also. Um, it enables student agency and different things because a lot of the students that I teach, they don't have exposure to activities and things that are outside of their immediate neighborhood. So it's my job as the educator to take them on field trips so that they can see some of these things that they would not ordinarily see. So if you can see in the pictures, there's pictures of my urban students doing pond dipping. That's actually in on the Ford estate. They're doing pond dipping. They're doing bird watch, bird walking. They're looking at bugs and native species. And these are things that they may not ordinarily get the opportunity to do, but through the use of field trips, they're able to get these experiences and again, it's culturally relevant and it, it, it broadens their horizons. Another thing that I like to do with my urban students is provide environmental education. 
Um, environmental education is a little bit different than place-based education because it's more focused on the environment and sustainability. I had the opportunity a couple months ago to attend the Nourish the Future conference where we talked about how to incorporate agriculture into the classroom and teach the students about the importance of food distribution and where food comes from and to help them become um, more environment, environmentally focused and look at ways to create a more sustainable future. So that was a great thing to do, a great place to go, but I got a lot of resources because all of the teachers who went, we were able to get hands-on activities and things that we could take back immediately into our classroom to teach the students. So my students at my building this year, we are looking at agriculture and how, even though we live in the inner city, how our food consumption and how the manufacturers and how the farms, how it all ties in and what place we play in that whole cycle. The next slide is a thank you for that portion of the presentation, but we're not quite done because I have to do my mToy updates. So but thank you from me and Stephanie. And as far as my updates, I did um, have a couple of cool things happen over the last month or so. I, I get to come here every month, so I try and let you know what I've done since then. I had the opportunity to get an award from the Macomb County Board of Commissioners. I am from Macomb County and that was pretty awesome to be recognized from my hometown. The I'm from Macomb, I'm from Mount Clemens, but that is in Macomb County, and the Macomb County Board of Commissioners is right downtown. So, to be recognized in your hometown was very, very rewarding, and it, it felt good to finally get recognized. I also had the opportunity to go to Central Michigan University. I had the opportunity to give the keynote address to the teacher candidates who are graduating in December. I was joined by, I think there were seven regional teachers of the year, including myself, and we gave presentations on everything from SES to special education and accommodations and various different things, and it was very very rewarding to be able to talk to the college students to see where they are, to hear about some of the programs, and to give them words of wisdom and inspiration as they're taking that next step into the teacher workforce and to see, you know, what 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 is coming down the pipeline. So that was a great experience. And it was also a, an experience for me and the other regional teachers of the year to explore a new town. Usually we come into Lansing and then we leave, but since we all stayed the night there, we got to do some our toy bonding, which was fun. I had the opportunity to do a couple of school visits. Not all of them are on here, but I went to Dr. Pugh's stomping ground. I went to Saginaw Public Schools. I was able to see a lot of the cool things that they have going on there. We talked about Grow Your Own programs and one of the pictures there. I had the opportunity to meet an educator who started out as a paraeducator and she was actually one of the featured teachers. So she's like a success story. She started out as a para pro and the lesson that I observed was so dynamic and it was a great experience to watch her in action because had they not told me, I would have thought that she had been doing it for many years and they said that she had just started. I also visited Kalkaska Public Schools. That's where Region 2's Teacher of the Year teaches. She wasn't there. It's actually kind of funny. She took ill right before I got there and her principal gave me the grand tour and I hear that she's never sick, so I don't know if she just didn't want to see me or what. <laughs> but she had a 104 temperature, but her principal did a great job taking me around. I saw lots of cool things. They actually had a dog in the Board of Education, so that was uh, different and fun. I wanted to take him home, and I tried to advocate for my district to get a dog, but 
not so much. <laughs> we heard about the libraries. One of the things that I heard in a presentation before was that there's different kind of libraries. There's the school library, the public library, and then the public school libraries. And in Kalkaska, I was able to see that it seems like they have a, a partnership with the public library and the school libraries where the librarians actually come into the schools and they are able to do the circulation. And if there's a book that I want to check out as a student that's not in the library at my school, the librarian can arrange for the book to come in and they all had library cards. And I thought that was pretty innovative. Visiting Kalkaska gave me the opportunity to see what it was like in a more rural area than what I'm used to. And so I also was able to see some of the challenges we talked about, you know, the fact that in a rural area, it's very, the population is spread out and, you know, how do we get the buses there and the, maybe the lack of personnel because the area is so big and we have special education students coming from 50 miles and how do we service them all in this one setting. So I got to see a, a different lens of education than I'm used to seeing. So that's one of the great things about going around and visiting the schools as the teacher of the year. But it's always a pleasure and I can't speak highly enough of the districts and how how well they treat me and the things that I see. I'm amazed every school district and every building that I go into. I just wish that they had told me. I'm looking at the one picture. It was pajama day and I was all dressed up and everyone had on pajamas, but you can't win them all. Um, last set of things I did over the last month, I did have the opportunity to go to the Future Proud Michigan Educator Explorer Conference. So the students who were here earlier, um, kind of they were from Eastern High School, so the Eastern Quakers, I had to look at my notes. I got to see the Quakers when they did their panel. I think that's a picture of them right there. I didn't know they were going to be here, so that was pretty cool to see them here and in person again and to see them up on the stage doing their question answer, answer panel. And to see the growth, actually, because some of them were quite nervous when they were on the stage. But when they were here today, they seemed more confident, like they had, you know, gotten their footing underneath them. And they spoke more confidently. So I felt like, even though I don't know them personally, I felt like a proud teacher moment, like, look, they've grown. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Rice was the keynote speaker there. So I had the opportunity to hear him speak there. And... I was very excited about what I heard about all of the initiatives of the Department of Education and how they are getting new teachers interested in a workforce, whether that's growing them from the elementary, middle school, high school, and uh, um, getting them from the community. So I learned a lot, and I was all ready to go back to my district and say, hey, this is what we need to do. We need to get a Grow Your Own program, or we need to do a partnership, and we need to get mentor teachers. So I don't know. I can tackle one thing at a time. I think that's it for us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to present again, and we look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you, Teachers Thank of the you. Year. Thank you very much. Uh, board members, questions, comments, reflections? I just, I, I know I want to go outside too. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 yeah the only one I didn't like was the one in with the kids in the snow suits and with the snow, <laughs> with that being upon us. Thank we're, you. We're, we're a season state, Dr. Pugh. <laughs> Got to give to get. There were parts of it I didn't like. I understand. No, I respect that. Anything else from, from board members? Um, just two reflections then from me. Ms. Nelson, I appreciate you mentioning that you're uh, used to speaking with kindergarten students. We will spare you the need to compare and contrast your experience today with your normal experience. And uh, Ms. Jackson, keep working on the dog. Don't give up on the dog, okay? I know in Detroit you've got lions and tigers, no bears. Oh, my. 
but keep uh, keep working on the dog. I know a um, a superintendent years ago who said absolutely not to dogs in schools. And uh, that superintendent, who, who I know quite well, changed his mind. Uh, other uh, principals and superintendents can and will too over a period of time. They really do dial kids down. Kids feel really comfortable around them, and you get different out of children um, mm -hmm. when they feel more comfortable in school. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you both. Thank you. Next item on today's agenda is state and federal legislative update. At 350 board, Mr. Marty Ackley, director of the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs, will lead the state and federal legislative update, followed by Dr. Pritchett on the State Board of Education Legislative Committee, and finally, Dr. Robinson with his typically hour-long report on NASB. Mr. Ackley. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Um, before I dig in, I'd like to take a point of privilege against the back window is Maureen Schaefer. Uh, she's a department analyst for the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. Uh, she's been my closest assistant for 17 years. Um, she has 17 years here, 38 years total in state government. She has worked in four other, three other departments, but by far her toughest Assignment has been the 17 years she's been supporting me and trying to keep me in line. So I, th I thank you for that. Now, her work has been important, impactful, and mostly unnoticed publicly, uh, but she has brought uh, tremendous light and professionalism to our work. And I want to appreciate and thank the board for this moment of privilege to acknowledge her publicly and thank her. I say that because uh, she's retiring at the end of this month, and this is her last state board meeting. Anyway, uh, today the state... You're right. What's that? <laughs> Certainly, right. Uh, she's smarter than some of us. Uh, today the state legislature adjourned sine die for the remainder of the year. Of course, sine die is Latin for we're out of here now. Uh, but the past year has been an active one um, for education reform in Michigan to assist get schools, educators, and students. Several of the important changes that the Department of Education sent to the legislature and the governor back in January as legislative priorities have been adopted. I'm going to run through quickly a list of those um, accomplishments. The repeal of the state A through F accountability system, the repeal of the retention portion of the read by grade three law, Revisions of the educator evaluation laws, uh, teacher and counselor reciprocities from other states to Michigan, the ability for retired educators to help out in schools after they've been uh, retired, uh, common sense gun laws, six new laws that will require universal background checks for all gun sales in Michigan, require safe storage of guns and ammunition in homes, lowering the cost of the purchase of firearm safety devices, and includes a red flag law to keep guns out of the hands of the people who have been shown to be dangerous to themselves and others. Several budgetary priorities have also been passed um, that were presented earlier today by Dr. Rice and Dr. Carnell uh, to help address the goals of Michigan's top 10 strategic education plan. Um, in other legislative action, um, the legislature has um, enrolled uh, voter registration, voter pre-registration, House Bill 4569. The bill would require the Department of Education to coordinate with the Sec Secretary of State for a public outreach campaign for 16-year-olds to pre-register to vote. Uh, the bill would also require MDE, the department, to ensure that registration materials are available to each public high school. Uh, this bill has been enrolled and has, uh, will be sent to the governor. Um, the legislature also signed the uh, Filter First bills. Um, Michigan will be the first state in the nation to require filtered drinking water at all schools and child care centers under the new laws signed by Governor Whitmer. Um, House Bill 5042, um, default retirement system uh, to revise the default option for newly hired public school employees to be automatically opted into Tier 1, uh, the retirement plan available to public school employees. That bill has been enrolled and sent, it will be sent to the governor. Uh, the House has passed uh, foster care education bills, three bills, have passed overwhelmingly in the House uh, last week to provide greater access and oversight 
of the education of children in the state's foster care system. Uh, the House also passed a, uh, three bills uh, regarding uh, school bus traffic laws. Uh, school bus fines, the bill uh, would increase the minimum civil infraction fine for individuals who pass a school bus that has activated its stop arm uh, from $100 to $250, as well as create a camera-based violations where the camera on the bus stop arm could be used. Uh, another bill would allow the school district, rather than the school, to equip a school bus and stop arm camera system and to enter into an agreement with the law enforcement agency to report violations. Um, also, uh, a bill was reported from the House Education Committee to support staff, to allow support staff to be a substitute teachers. The FAFSA bill, which has been discussed um, a few times here at the board, uh, passed the Senate by a vote of 20 to 18. Um, it has been sent over to the House and referred to the House Education Committee. And then there were some uh, charter school financial transparency bills that have had a hearing in the House Education Committee. House Bill 5231 through 5234 would require a, con a contract issued to organize and administer a public school academy, school of excellence, or strict discipline academy, or an urban high school academy to contain a requirement that the name of the authorizing body and educational management organization appear on all signage, advertising, and promotional material for that public, uh, for that PSA, for the charter school, unless prohibited by local ordinance or local zoning authority. House Bill 5269 would require a public school academy to post salary information on its website. Now, these bills clearly do not provide the sort of financial tr transparency that the State Board of Education and MDE have, ur have urged, uh, but we, in discussions with the um, chairman of the House Education Committee, these bills were just the, the first um, set of bills in a larger package that he is trying to get introduced and will be um, acted upon hopefully next year. Um, and then I know that Dr. Pugh had asked about earlier about the um, school debt relief um, included in a, the general supplemental bill. Um, the legislature passed a month ago, the bill, or recently, few, uh, past few weeks. The bill has been enrolled but not yet signed. Um, it did not get immediate effect, so the funds will not be available until 90 days from today. Um, included in that budget were $114.1 million in school aid funds. Um, for school district emergency load debt relief. The funding will be distributed to uh, five acting current uh, school districts and one school district, a former school district that has been closed, but it still has an outstanding uh, loan fund balance. A boilerplate stipulates that the remaining funding must be used to either retire debt of either the former Ipsy school district or the former Willow Run community district. Um, now these aren't going to be checks that are just going to be written out to the to the school districts. There are some um, qualifying uh, pieces in the boilerplate that the school districts must do in order to get these funds, uh, including develop and implement a district-wide strategic plan for the recruitment and retention of students to increase student enrollment. So there are criteria that go along with these uh, with these checks that are going to be, be written by Treasury. This is all being done by Treasury Department of Treasury, even though they are. Uh, school aid funds. And there are several other uh, things that um, school districts who receive these funds um, have the uh, choice to do. They have to do one of the following, including develop and implement a capital improvement strategic plan, develop and implement a strategic plan to attract and retain certified teachers, uh, school board training program with a minimum of three training sessions per year, and the training must focus on topics related to managing school district finances. Uh, identify and implement strategic or specific policies to increase grad rates and reduce the number of students who do not complete high school um, and identify and implement specific policies to increase attendance rates and reduce the number of students who are identified as chronically absent. So those are some of the options that school districts must choose in order to uh, get those funds. Um, so that's really, I guess that's my report. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ashley. Ms. Lipton. Just a quick question. So, so the, I just want to make sure I understand. So the school district comes up with a plan for <clears throat> how they're going to go forward uh, as a condition of getting the debt relief, but all of that 
um, the, the plan, if you will, is going to be reviewed and analyzed by Treasury. Correct. With no input from the department in terms of what makes for a healthy school or, I mean. I have to get back with you on that. I, I don't have a definitive answer for that. I mean, if, if it's just Treasury, seems to me that that is not giving the schools all the potential tools that they have because with all of the expertise that is in the department, it seems that maybe not mandatory, but at least as a best practice for those plans to at least be run by educators would be a good idea. Yeah. I'm not sure but if there's an approval process or what that process would be for those plans in order to get the, the funding from Treasury. I'll have to check and also see if we have input on that. It's a good question. Other uh, reflections? Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Mr. Uh, Ms. Snyder. So regarding the capacity to pre-register every 16-year-old in the state from MDE standpoint, was that um, work done before the law was created and passed in the legislature? Was what work done? The capacity to pre-register every 16-year-old to vote in the state of Michigan. I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. So the capacity for the department. Oh to pre-register every 16-year-old to vote in the state of Michigan. I think there may be some lack of clarity. The department isn't going to pre-register any right. child, let alone every child. Right. Would you care to clarify? Yeah, we provide the, um, the information and present it to the school districts. And the school districts work with the Secretary of State's office too to inform the, it's more of an awareness campaign. Okay, so it's not a requirement. No. Okay. No. Understood. Yeah. Just making sure. Um, other uh, questions or comments from board members? Dr. Pugh. Just a comment. I, as you were talking about the drinking water and uh, Michigan being first in the nation, I built, I pulled up um, a, was this a resolution? It was a statement. We were doing more statements at that time. And it was adopted September 12th, 2017, and it was on Michigan State Board of Education statement on school drinking water testing, monitoring, and maintenance where we um, called for guidance, uh, that we provide more guidance on flushing pipes um, and filtering as deemed necessary. But we, this was a bipartisan um, statement that we put out together on addressing school water safety. So I just wanna, I, I, I feel like I'm the historian here, like I'm the oldest person at the table here. So just recollecting I'll years take ago. to that <laughs> Well, this is true. This is true. <laughs> but anyway, so it's, it's just good to hear. Um, and a lot of what we put in here, including even dropping um, the action level for lead and drinking water uh, that we put in has been dropped. So yeah. kudos to us. Very good. Thank you very much, Dr. Pugh. Other reflections? What else do you have? I was just going to say the State Board of Education's Legislative Committee um, met on November 2nd and discussed several of the issues that I've shared today. And uh, if there's no other questions, I'd pass it over to the chair, Dr. Judy Pritchett, to continue. That was that was beautiful. Th thank you. Um, and um, Obviously, Marty gave an excellent report, an overview. It's been a busy year, um, very positive year, but there are still some dangling participles, which will be taken up here um, as soon as the legislature uh, reconvenes. Uh, our next meeting is January 3rd at 1230. Uh, so um, that will be on uh, the board calendar, and you can access it via Teams. Um, and I'm going to segue, if that's all right, to NASB, only because I was able to attend the NASB National Conference and just wanted to um, kind of highlight a couple of things that I thought um, were um, pretty exciting. Probably the most exciting for me was uh, being able to um, see Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond in person um, and listen to her um, 
information for a couple of hours. I have been a follower for, for years and years as an educator, and so uh, it was good to be able to be in her presence and listen to her uh, vision. Um, the other thing that um, I was more surprised about was I sat in on a session on artificial intelligence, and quite frankly, I went into it kind of like, well, not sure, you know, about this. I was like blown away. First of all, the presenter was um, pretty dynamic, but um, it piqued my interest. And so I um, uh, am going to uh, look into that a little bit more. Um, and um, he just did a very nice job, I think, of giving the entire room a, a good uh, overview of it. And I wanted to officially thank Tiffany, who um, represented the board at the uh, business meeting for NASB this year, so that was helpful. And that's all I've got, unless anybody's got any questions. Thank you, Dr. Pritchett. Any questions for Dr. Pritchett? Once, twice, thrice. Dr. Robinson. No, I don't have anything on NASB. I do have a comment for the next section. Okay, all right, very good. Um, hearing no other comments or questions on this section, um, if we could have a motion to move the resolution uh, to honor Ms. Kathy Strauss, our former board uh, president and uh, board member for 24 years. Um, so I've got a. Um, Give it to her. Okay, I've got a. Um, I've got a, a move by Ms. Lipton. I've got a second by Dr. Robinson. Um, discussion, and we will go to our board president, Dr. Pugh, to read it into the record. Resolution honoring the 100th birthday of Kathleen N. Strauss. Whereas Kathleen N. Kathy Strauss was first elected to the State Board of Education in 1992, re-elected in 2000, and re-elected again in 2008 to fulfill three eight-year terms spanning January 1st, 1993 to January 1st, 2017. And whereas Kathy served seven two-year terms as president of the State Board of Education and previously served as secretary of National Association of the State boards of education delegate as elected by her peers, whereas Kathy has served on and led many national, state, and community boards and initiatives to promote and advance a quality education and a positive quality of life for all children, whereas Kathy was awarded the David Kasilko Kis Award from the National Association of State Boards of Education 2016, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Anti-Defamation League 2004, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Jewish Committee 2010, and the Wade Hampton McCree Jr. Award for the Federal Bar Association Eastern District, District of Michigan Chapter 2011, and has been selected as a member of the Hunter College Hall of Fame 1994, the Michigan Education Hall of Fame 1994, and the Michigan's Women Hall of Fame 2000. Whereas Kathy was born in New York City on December 3rd, 1923, and will therefore be celebrating her 100th birthday next month. Whereas to date, Kathy has witnessed the Great Depression, the Holocaust, World War II, the Cold War, the New Deal, the Civil Rights Movement, and the Civil Rights Act of 1964, among others. The Women's Movement, a human in outer space, and one on the moon, the desegregation of public education, the invention of the World Wide Web, and the emergence of computers, email, and cell phones, color television, rock and roll, satellites, and GPS, the election of the first African-American president, and the election of the first woman governor of Michigan. Whereas Kathy has always lived a life of honor, distinction, optimism, grace, and dignity, now therefore be it resolved that the Michigan State Board of Education extends to Kathleen and Strauss its highest regard and profound gratitude on her upcoming 100th birthday, and be it further resolved that the Michigan State Board of Education expresses its heartfelt wish that Kathleen N. Strauss continues to enjoy many rewarding experiences with their family, friends, and colleagues. We have a uh, motion. We have a second. Uh, we've had the resolution read into the record. Um, her birthday is only 19 days away. Board, make your debate short. Um, any discussion associated therewith? Hearing none, if we could have a roll call vote, please. Bullock? Yes. Lipton? Yes. McMillan? Yes. Pritchett? Yes. Pugh? Yes. Robinson? Yes. Snyder? Yes. Tilly? Yes. Motion carries. Very good. Thank you so much.
Um, and I must say, I didn't write this. This was very nicely written. It was very so, nicely written with a with appreciation yeah, to uh, Marty Ackley for uh, for for that. Yeah. Marty lived through many Thank of you. those events. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, the, the, the issue is not living through them. The issue is remembering them. But we appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, board, we are um, at State Board of Education comments at 409. Uh, Dr. Robinson, I believe you got your uh, oar in the water first. <clears throat> I just wanted, I, I appreciated the presentation on the teacher shortage, among other topics earlier. Uh, it's something I've been working on as a research area for years, and I just had a, a couple of thoughts about I wanted to share. I'm not sure what we're seeing here is so much a teacher shortage as it is a slow motion teacher walkout with much the same effect. Um, what I'm hearing from my former students who have left the profession is the driving force behind that decision has to do with feeling not just a lack of support from some in their communities, but feeling actively attacked just for trying to do their jobs. So while incentives to attract new teachers are good, I'm all for it, we also need to incentivize experienced teachers to stay in the classroom. Um, increasing pay for new teachers is fine, but we have too many veteran teachers whose pay has been virtually frozen for years and years while the demands on them have only increased. So how do we do that? How do we keep those teachers? Well, we have to improve working conditions, improve evaluation procedures. Some of these were, were starting to get done. Improve pay and build pathways for career growth that don't force teachers out of the classroom into administrative roles in higher ed or out of education entirely. It's worth mentioning the current US House budget proposal calls for a cut of around 30% in federal education funding a cut that would translate into 220,000 fewer teachers in classrooms across the country. The loss of experienced teachers in our state and nationally will not be fixed simply by attracting new teachers. The brain drain there in the exchange will be enormous. So we need to both bail out the leaking boat and plug the hole. Yeah. So I just wanted to offer those thoughts about the teacher shortage, which if I was a superintendent or a principal, I see classrooms in my buildings that don't have people in front of them. So I totally get it. But the problem is not just can we find some new bodies to plug in there. It's what are we what are we doing to stop veteran teachers from leaving before they really want to and making the job worth sticking around for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Robinson. Who's next? Ms. Snyder. First I'll say I didn't mess this up which you're supposed to sign underneath your name. So I left very little room for you, sorry. I can <laughs> squeeze out, no right. problem. Um, I'm just going to uh, you know, share with the board, there are nine planes that are filled with Jews, including students of Jewish faith. Today they're traveling to the pro-Israel march uh, in DC. And it, this is just from Detroit. And these students are active, they're engaged, they're currently under attack. Anti-Semitism across our country has been on the rise for the last decade. And now, unfortunately, it has cover under the guise of war. But this march is a peaceful and physical show of force in the name of the freedom and liberty to simply exist. It's the free exercise thereof on full display. We believe in that. It's in our Constitution, and it's what we stand for on the world stage, and I think it's a very beautiful thing to support. Thank you very much, Ms. Snyder. Uh, Mr. McMillan. Um, I just would report that I know that there's teachers that are walking out. They're walking out because they're being forced to sexualize little children. They're being told to tell little second and third grader that if they're white, they're oppressors, and so are their parents, and that they're, uh, and also for the harmful COVID policies. So it's really, uh, there is a, a, a large number of teachers leaving, um, but it's because of really bad policies that are being imp imposed that uh, were never there or never dreamed of when they went through uh, their teacher colleges. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. Who's next? Ms. Tilly. Thank you. Um, I can't wait until next month so we have the presentation on foster youth. And um, just want to publicly say thank you to um, to State Rep Stephanie Young for all of the hard work she has done with the foster care package. Um, House Bill 4676-77 has passed the House. I am so ecstatic about that. Um, 
and I am looking forward to it um, passing in the Senate. It is a, a nonpartisan issue and it got support on both sides. And so our foster youth will be able to have opportunities that they should have always had in Michigan. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tilly. Other board members? Vice Thrice, hearing none. Happy holiday. The oh, meetings yeah. of the State Board of Education are Tuesday, December 12th, January 9th, and February 13th, all at 9.30 a.m., all regular board meetings. Uh, if there are any topics board members would like included in the future meeting agendas, please notify Ms. Evans.